Thank you. Hey, sir, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Life is good and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I just left all my uh, budget books at the office. I didn't realize it until I get off the turnpike. <laughs> Too far to turn back. But well, don't do that tomorrow night. <laughs> hey, how are you, hey, Caitlin? Hey. Good. Good to see you. I was just going to say, did I get to be first? I think uh, first, first official through the door. <laughs> Mark it down. I know. I just put a checkbox <laughs> next to your name. Gold star. <laughs> right. If I had to drive up there, I'd be late. I hear you. <laughs> hey, Valerie. Hey, Penny. You there. Get my audio working. Okay. So that second that second link worked fine. Thanks. Apparently. Awesome. Yeah. Now of course the links are coming through after you sent you sent that to me. But oh sure, that's all right. Right, but still. Thank you. To do it on the fly. Yeah. Oh. Galen, I like where you're at. <laughs> I know. That's, I think that's when I was in Hawaii. Like, like two decades ago. That looks great. Jeremy, how are you, sir? Doing well. How are you, Matt? Doing fine, thank you. <clears throat> Jeremy. Yes. Did your wife cut hair? You <laughs> You're so yeah, lucky. <laughs> I can't mind. Can cut her over? <laughs> yeah, mine's growing. Yeah, my daughter has never seen my hair this long in her entire life. <laughs> She's like, wow, you've got, you've got a lot of curls and waves, Dad. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> How are you, Donna? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. I wanted to make sure I could get on. My my internet's been in and out all day. So. Uh-oh. Yeah. It, it's pretty calm out there now, though. So. <laughs> yeah, it is. Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Chris. Chris, you shouldn't have your chair down by the light. The park's closed. <laughs> I know. That's what I thought. Isn't the park closed? It's a great picture, though. We're going to have to send Chris Cutter down to move that chair. I, I've never been happier than when I woke up this morning and found that we didn't have three inches of snow on the ground. <laughs> that would have been so bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that last one, that one to three inches ended up with eight inches and it was mostly gone by the time we came home the next night, but I did not, I did not want another surprise like that. No. It was beautiful on Saturday though. It certainly was. Made it all worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. We were on a Zoom meeting this morning. Uh, both Valerie Adams and I were, and uh, one of the panelists had to move to someplace else within our house and she picked up her laptop and I texted Valerie. I said, oh, we just got a virtual tour of, uh, <laughs> of that home, all, both, both floors. You can see down, down the stairs. And <laughs> I have a 
Elizabeth. Hello. Hey, Elizabeth. How are you doing tonight? Good. How's it going? Long time no see. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like Caitlin's background. Ooh. That's beautiful. Not cool. really fit. <laughs> Where I want to be right now. <laughs> not in Maine. Although, I don't know. Hawaii is not on the news ever. How are they doing? Uh, they were discussing uh, not good easing easing their rules of social distancing, and I think they're going to be going through the month of May, is what the uh, mm. governor had said. Uh, I think I heard that yesterday. Hmm. Oh boy, I could find a way to be socially distant in Hawaii, though. I feel like <laughs> very few understood that we have tremendous capacity. Then when we <laughs> Marcy. Hi, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Perfect. Great. Hi, everybody. Can anybody see Hi, Marcy? Tree's name on here. Yes. You He's see it? Has okay. him as an, as an attendee. Okay. I'm getting some text here. If uh, if we need to refer to folks if they're an attendee and uh, you want us to pull them in, just let me know and we can we can pull them in and then and then okay. once they're done providing input, we can then uh, escape them from the from the Hollywood squares too. <laughs> Do you see Peter Esposito, Matt? No, uh, Jeff Shed. Oh yes, uh, uh, I see Jeff. I'm not sure if uh, I don't think I see Peter on here yet. Okay. I hope the questions are just as fun as Hollywood Squares. I know. I was just gonna say, Elizabeth. <laughs> I I think that would be fun. <laughs> I know, and you've got kind of like Jeremy is the center square, maybe, and <laughs> right. <laughs> Caitlin's the blocker. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> Valerie's still with us. <laughs> still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Valerie. Hey, Phil. Hey, Matt. There's Phil. Hi, Good. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Hey, Jamie. Everyone's so quiet tonight. <laughs> I think Heather is having trouble connecting or is waiting to come in. There's Nassau.
Heather's in. Oh, good. Thanks. And we Got have it. a couple of other members who are uh, who are on uh, with uh, inactive video. Um, is Dell's name on the list, Matt? Yes, okay. Dell is here. All right. <laughs> the administrators are all texting me, asking me if they're all, if they're in. Okay. Yes, uh, Jeff Thorick is on. Uh, Dell is here. Nasser, I don't know the proper greeting for Ramadan, but happy Ramadan. Yes, that's fine. It says Ramadan Mubarak or Ramadan oh. Kareem. Oh. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Greetings. How are you guys doing? I want to yeah. know where is my spring, where is my summer, comes <laughs> the winter. We're just thankful that he's missed now. Did we lose Laura? I thought we had her. She was, she was on. Hmm. And she is not at this point in time. I don't know if she got booted out, but I saw the little thing flash by that say she had left. And Laura might have to tap in and out tonight. She's on parent duty a little bit. So that could be what's happening as well. <laughs> She texted me that earlier today, so there she is. She's back with us. Matt, we can begin whenever you feel ready. It looks to me like the full council is here and I'm not sure how many members of the board will be attending this evening, so. <clears throat> We're missing Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And Hope. Yep, I'm texting them right now to see if they're having trouble getting in and we'll see how that goes. Oh, There's Hope. Hope. So I'm texting Kimberly quickly. Oh. Matt, is Peter Esposito in now? It's conceivable people might be trying to click on the 428 um, Zoom link, which would be, I think, was that tomorrow's? So they might be sitting there waiting for tomorrow's meeting because we were sent links for both today and tomorrow's. Yeah. Yeah, that was my advice to Chris. To me. <laughs> And me. I was not going to out you, Heather. <laughs> Peter is on board, Donna. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep, you're good to go. Jamie, uh, as, as the chairman of the finance committee, whenever you'd like to get started, sir, I think we're good to go. There we go. It wouldn't come off a of mute. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you uh, and welcome everybody to the Monday, April 27th, uh, 2020 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Finance Committee. Um, appreciate everybody coming together uh, and hope and trust that everybody is uh, doing well and taking good care um, and continuing to be well and healthy. Um, so tonight's agenda item is a presentation of the uh, fiscal 21 
uh, budget from the school board. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to make a couple of opening comments and then we'll open it up for um, a chance for the public to participate and comment. Uh, and then we'll get into a presentation uh, led by uh, school board finance chair, uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Um, I wanna first just uh, uh, say that, um, you know, the work that has been done on both the school budget as well as on the municipal budget is work that started um, many months ago. Uh, I think in the case of the school budget, it started um, towards the end of calendar year 19 and certainly on the fiscal, um, you know, carrying, you're looking ahead to the next fiscal year and, and as the calendar turned to 2020, uh, work picked up in earnest. And certainly on the town side, um, you know, uh, similar schedule. Uh, the, the reason I bring all that up is obviously the world looked like a very different place um, when that work began than what it looks like today. Um, so uh, I'm appreciative of uh, the work that the town manager has done uh, along with his staff and the work that uh, the superintendent and her staff and school board have done uh, to get us to this place. Um, I, uh, I only bring you know, that to the, the forefront of the discussion today um, as a point of emphasis around um, things have changed a lot. And so uh, in, in the spirit of uh, dialogue and um, uh, cooperation and things like that, um, I, I, I hope that we'll move forward um, you know, uh, cooperatively uh, with that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to is just our overall calendar and schedule. Um, without getting too far ahead of uh, the work of the council, I know that um, there have been some discussions, as many are aware, um, the state election that was previously scheduled for June has moved to July, uh, I believe July 14th, uh, by order of the governor. And many communities and towns uh, in our area and throughout the state are uh, uh, taking the prerogative to move their previously scheduled June municipal elections uh, to align with that state election in July. What that means for Cape Elizabeth is the prospect of potentially moving our regularly scheduled um, uh, budget referendum vote from its currently scheduled June date uh, out to align with that July 14th date. If you were to backdate a schedule from there, uh, for the terms of the charter, the town council needs to vote on the school budget and put that forward uh, for the warrant uh, 30 days prior to the uh, referendum uh, election taking place. So that would take us to honor about June 15th. Uh, Currently, we're scheduled for that to happen on May 11th. And as I said, I, I expect that action of the council will be to move that out. Um, what that does is buys us um, just a little bit more time, not a, not a tremendous amount of time, but um, hopefully an amount of time that um, uh, will yield further concrete information uh, in, a, in a world where today we have a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties, uh, even if in just 30 to 40 days or so extra uh, we may find that we have more information available to us than what we have today. Um, and uh, again, provide a little bit more time for um, dialogue uh, back and forth, both amongst the council, uh, as well as um, staff and members of the school board. So um, we also uh, have tomorrow evening uh, a scheduled uh, earmarked date um, for follow on discussion to tonight's, um, tonight's discussion. So. In past years, that's been earmarked and, and not necessarily often used. Um, I, uh, I'm anticipating the likelihood of, of needing to have further discussion tomorrow and have um, let folks know that that's likely to be the case. Uh, the town council also has um, a special meeting of its own scheduled beginning at six o'clock prior to that scheduled workshop tomorrow to take up some other business actions uh, related to the um, uh, COVID-19 emergency. Um, we currently have a uh, hearing scheduled for Monday, May 4th, uh, again, subject to um, some change and tinkering based on the overall budget schedule. But um, if that public hearing holds uh, uh, it, as still in effect for the, for the municipal budget, it will take place then. And uh, potential municipal budget vote still holding on Monday, the 11th. So, um, I'll pause for just a second to see if there's any questions from council or the school board or staff um, 
relating to any of that. And Matt, you'll have to help me if you see hands raised because I don't have that view up. Yes, sir. There we go. Now I do. Um, so anybody from the council or school board that just has any questions about what I just laid out? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, so um, before we get going to the presentation, um, now is the time of the meeting uh, and there will be an opportunity at the end of the meeting as well for the public to comment on items on the agenda. Um, so our, again, our loan item is this presentation of the fiscal 21 school budget. So if you are um, joining us uh, either online or on the phone and wish to um, offer any comment uh, or public statement, you're welcome to do so now. Please just identify yourself, uh, give us your address and or affiliation, uh, and please limit your comments to approximately three minutes. Um, the public comment period is scheduled for 15 minutes, and if the council decides, uh, we can extend that if need be. Uh, I will do my best to keep time uh, and try and give a little bit of a signal uh, for folks um, to let them know that their time is up. But if you could keep an eye on that yourselves, so that would help us to move along. So uh, with that, uh, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak, please use the raise hand function um, in the uh, participant box um, or uh, the if you're dial, I don't know if we have anybody dialed in by phone. It doesn't look like it. Uh, so just you know, the, the raise hand function. I'm seeing Marianne Lynch as uh, first one with her hand raised. Go ahead, Marianne. Matt, I'll get you unmuted in just a second. There you go. Am I unmuted? You yes. are. Thank okay, you for joining. Great. First of all, I want to thank all of you. I know that this budget process began in a time when the economy was high flying record stock market, record unemployment, and I appreciate that uh, the, our entire economic situation has taken a 180 degree turn just at the end of your budget process. So I, um, I, I really do, uh, my heart goes out to you. I've uh, served in, uh, on the council and uh, I have to say that I have never served in as extraordinary a time as you are all serving. So. Um, I will just speak to one issue tonight. I worked uh, intimately with the Appropriations Committee for eight years on the state budget process, and I, f including through the last downturn of the economy. This is in every way shaping up to be far worse, and I fully expect that uh, revenue sharing and general purpose aid to education will, will have to be cut. Uh, the largest portions of the state revenue are sales and income tax. And uh, I fully expect that by uh, later this year, the legislature will come in and amend the budget and um, cut the general purpose aid and the revenue sharing uh, significantly. So I would request that your budgets be flat funded and that you um, have a budget that reflects the great likelihood that we are going to be looking at significant cuts in state aid, and also the great likelihood that many in our community are unemployed, underemployed, and their businesses are threatened. So with that, I thank you very much. And I don't think I identified that I live at Two Old Colony Lane. Thank you. I, I was gonna ask, thank you very much. Uh, next person with their hand raised is Jessica Sullivan. Jessica, uh, give Matt a second to unmute you and go ahead. Jessica, are you there? You might have to unmute yourself on your end. Hey, Jessica, are you there? Looks like she's dropped off, Jamie. Okay, um, we'll see if she joins back in. Um, is there anybody else from the public that wishes to comment at this time? I see Susanna Hubs's hand raised. Susanna, go uh, ahead. Hi. hi. 
Yep. I'm uh, Susanna Mazel hubs I live at 18 Belfield Road. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here tonight in these really strange um, circumstances, for doing all the work you have been doing um, in this crazy time. I sent an email earlier, uh, not that long ago, and I just wanted to um, uh, have my have my uh, voice heard in that. I, I want to thank the school board and the administrators, Donna, uh, for all the hard work they've done um, to create a budget that I think is uh, very responsible and very um, sensitive to the current situation. Um, I think that I was very encouraged to see some, some new um, additions of custodians um, being on the building committee, you know, that is something that uh, we've talked about having been cut in the years. Um, and uh, even though we don't know which direction we're headed yet, building wise, we greatly need the custodians um, to take care of what we have for now. Um, but basically, I, I want to um, just say that I hope that the budget, uh, the school budget is approved um, by the town council. I, I we owe it to our students and we owe it to our town to have this one thing that I consider one of our greatest assets to be a constant in our town, um, not to change despite the circumstances. And, and it's still very sensitive to uh, the climate. Um, it's not irresponsible, it's sensitive. And I encourage you to um, maintain stability on this front. Thank you all so much for what you do. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I see that Jessica's rejoined, so I'm gonna go back to her. Um, so Matt, if you can tee her up again. Just a second, Jessica. For some reason I'm having a problem unmuting her. No, wait a second. Go ahead. Jessica, I'm not sure if your if yours is muting on your end as well. Okay. Oh, I think we yeah. got you. Good to go. There you go. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your patience. Well, thank you. Um, I just um, wanted to thank, first of all, I want to say good evening. Thank you all for your service to the town. I know this is a workshop and you won't be voting, but I, I uh, <clears throat> want to urge you to support flat budgets for next year. That is no increase from last year's budgets for either municipal or the school department. I know that you, uh, the council has received a chart today that was put together by Bill Downs, who is a financial analyst here in Cape. It shows a relationship with the school budget and school enrollment since 2006, when we had a peak enrollment of 1,847 students. Um, <clears throat> if the school department predictions are correct, we're going to lose 30, 23 students this coming fall, making a decline of 295 students since 2006. Um, <clears throat> I find the school budget frustrating because it wants to increase by nearly 6%, add new staff, 13 staff, while we're still losing students. I just want to say that I don't think this is the time to raise property taxes from either the municipal or um, school department, especially when we're facing another drop in school enrollment. All Cape residents are feeling the devastating effects of this global, global financial and public health crises. The virus is expected to surge again in the fall, so we're going to be in this frightening situation for quite some time. You know, as counselors, you represent all the residents and taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth. I hope we can all, let's just say, let's hope for the best, but please plan for the worst and please don't raise our property taxes in this crazy time. Thank you. Thank you. And Jessica, just um, could you give us your address? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I live at 441 Mitchell Road. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, I see Kathy Ray with her hand raised. So Matt, if you could cue her up. Just a second, Kathy. You're live, Kathy. 
Hi. Okay, Hi. can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. My name's Kathy Ray. I live at 532 Spurwink Avenue. Um, I was on the school board for eight years, including two years as chair. I was on the town council for six years, including one year as chair. So I'm very familiar with all the budgets that you're working on. And I thank you for your service. It can be a very hard thing to do. Um, what I wanted to bring up was uh, class size. And back in 2017, the school board changed class size and they reduced it, um, which supported higher staffing levels, um, which increased the school budget and decreased the amount of general purpose aid that Cape Elizabeth received from the state. So I want you to keep that in mind as you're making your decision about the school budget. Um, I would also like to see you fund both a flat budget for the schools and the municipality. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, next up is Rosemary Townsend. Uh, Rosemary, give Matt just a second to queue you up and go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Rosemary Townsend at Seven Field Stone Road. Um, I also support a flat budget for this year, just on my own street of eight houses. Um, there's one family that uh, their income is down low enough now that they uh, qualify for free food. My next door neighbor is a small business and um, they're down to one client in a consulting firm. So it's very, very real. And um, Maine is noted to be one of the most effective states in terms of the economic hit because of the tourism and um, uh, uh, you know because of the economic situation, the tourism and the job um, uh, quality that we have here. Uh, so I think it's very, very important to be very, very careful with what we do with the school budget. And also, since we don't know anything about sports um, and how and if they can continue, I did notice that one of the things was an assistant for the uh, uh, sports director. Uh, and I think that's something we should reconsider because why are we adding something to something we may never even do this year? Um, but in any case, I thank you because I know your hard work was done when everything was high and um, going really well. And now it's just absolutely tanked. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person with their hand raised is Jim Walsh. Uh, Jim, give Matt just a second. Did we lose Jim? Nope, he's uh, just a moment. There you go. I just unmuted. There, there you go, Jim. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, again, um, I mirror everyone else's opinion about uh, the good work that all of you have done over the last uh, several months, uh, lots of time and energy and effort. I think it's interesting that you have a lot of folks who have stepped up to talk with you this evening who have vested their own personal time over the past few years in making Cape Elizabeth a great place to live. Um, I speak to you tonight because um, I have lost my job at L.L. Bean after 13 years. So the lens that I now view, everything that Kathy and I do is very different. And I speak to you from the heart. Um, as you view what it is you're about to consider, I would suggest you have to roll it back and you have to look at the reality of what we're currently in the middle of. With all of the unknowns that are on the table, it is absolutely essential that we take a good look at what we've proposed and what we can or cannot do. and Come up with a process that will develop the best answer for all of the Cape Elizabeth residents, not just one group versus another. At the end of the day, I have a lot of time on my hands now. And as I said in my email to you earlier today, 
more than happy to participate in whatever group you might put together to take a look at the two proposed budgets and determine what can be either eliminated, delayed, or in some way funded some other process. Um, I have absolutely no confidence that we're going to get the kind of aid out of the state that I think we've assumed in these two budgets. Um, in my early town council time, I never had to deal with what you folks are dealing with today. Um, we did have um, LePage zero out funding for towns and schools. We did have 9-11 that basically threw everybody for a loop, but nothing like what you folks have on the table today. And the biggest issue that you have to contend with is that you need to be making assumptions about what you think it's going to be or what it could be. And all I would ask you to do is vested townspeople who have put the time and energy and effort into making this a great place to live, that you continue to do that and that you take a second look at what you have come up with. While it's all great work, a lot of good assumptions, as the school department indicated, cautious and conservative, guided by goals and objectives, all of that's well and good. But what we've experienced in the last seven weeks, no one ever could have anticipated. So I ask you, take a good hard look at what you've done. And I, as one who has more time on my hands now than ever, I'm willing to help. And I'm sure there are lots of other citizens in this community that are willing to step up and help solve this issue. Thank you for your service to the town. And I appreciate you giving me the chance to talk. Thanks, Jim. Um, we're at about 15 minutes of public comment now. I don't see anybody else uh, with their hand raised. Is there anybody else? Uh, oh, I see Nancy Thompson. Is there anybody else? Um, if, if you are interested in speaking, if you could raise your hand now so we can have just a sense of how many people we might be looking to extend for here if we do that. I see Nancy, is there anybody else? Okay, uh, unless there's objection from the council, uh, I'll uh, welcome Nancy's comment and then we'll move on uh, to the agenda. So Nancy, your mic is open, go ahead. So Pine Ridge oh, yeah. Road, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm calling as a small business owner and obviously a huge supporter of the Cape Elizabeth schools for the past 35 years. Um, just going to reiterate a couple of other things that uh, Rosemary had said that, you know, we all know that small business is the engine of the main economy, along with our tourism. And without those important income taxes and sales taxes uh, that these entities produce, the state of Maine will take a long time to come back. And you know that, and I know that. Um, this will require our school board and our town council to take a, a careful approach to getting our budget for 2021 right-sized. Locally, as we all know, we have a lot of professionals in this town, doctors, lawyers, business owners with high-end salaries whose revenues are all off due to closing their offices. They're not generating any income to see clients or patients are not able to do surgeries, et cetera, just like Jim talked about. We also can't forget about the retired senior citizens who will receive little or no increase in their social security and the retirement income and possibly a reduction in the future. Um, we also have a lot of people who've lost their job or have been asked to cut their hours or been furloughed who can't pay their property and their excise taxes now. This ripple effect hits us locally by taking in less property taxes and excise taxes and puts a strain on our budget. I hope you can all lead us in the right direction and make the tough decisions to help our town to continue to work moving forward with the one town concept. 
which as you well know is when the town council and the school board work closely and cooperate in the best interest of all of our citizens. You have the responsibility as our leaders to take the initiative right now to help us all during these difficult times. And as someone once said, a leader takes people where they want to go. Great leaders take people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. Thank you all for your time, efforts, and countless hours of volunteering to benefit our town. Thank you, Nancy. Um, if there's no further comment at this time, and I'm not seeing any hands raised, I'll remind everybody that um, we will have opportunity for comment uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, is there um, last call for any public comment for right now, though? Okay. Seeing none, um, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, pleased to have the school board here to participate with us. Um, and uh, I know that Elizabeth Seifries, their finance chair, has prepared a presentation to walk us through. Um, so with no further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Jamie. Um, in a minute, uh, I'm gonna ask town manager Matt Sturgis to share his screen with you so you can see my presentation. This is sort of the funny way we have to do this and I have to say that I miss sitting with you all. There's a different energy when we're all together in um, town chambers and I miss that. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the citizens that have um, emailed and made phone calls and um, otherwise made their thoughts known. I appreciate everybody getting involved and giving input and I think that's the best way for this uh, one town concept to work, that we all work together. What I would beg people to do is to stay engaged and um, strive to have factual information. I also would like to thank all of our educators, um, not just on uh, the budget side of things, but I'd like to just take this moment to thank them for their um, an enormous pivot for their incredibly increased work and for everything that they're doing to support our students in this extraordinary time. I'd like to thank the administrators in the Cape Elizabeth School Department also for their incredibly difficult work right now, but also for their budget work, which began probably in November or December of 2019. Um, they review everything. They, they look at every single program. It, we don't believe in just rolling things over. We believe in reviewing everything to make sure that we are getting the maximum amount of benefit out of you know, every nickel spent. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow school board members for weeks and weeks and weeks of work and meetings and uh, conversation about this budget. Um, Everybody has been incredibly sensitive and thoughtful, but at the same time, quite rigorous. And so I thank you. I also thank Superintendent Donna Wolfram for guiding us through this process, for uh, steering the administrative ship, and for, for taking a very conservative approach to all this. We appreciate you very much, Donna. Um, getting close to the end of my thank yous, I need to thank um, the finance director of the town of Cape Elizabeth, John Q. It has been a pleasure to work with you. Um, I am so glad that you are a part of this uh, town government now, and I feel like you know, you're helping keep this ship in the right direction as well. Marcy Weeks, our new business manager, couldn't, no one could do this without you. We appreciate your work and um, feel so grateful that you're here. And then finally, I would like to thank the entire town council and specifically um, the current and past members of the finance subcommittee. Our work together, our communication, our collaboration has just been tremendous. I think that we are in a fantastic position to work collaboratively and we have been for the last uh, two years. It's, it's been excellent, so thank you. I just wanna give a quick shout out to uh, Chris Straw who was on finance subcommittee to um, Valerie, I'm gonna, I'm trying not to say your, <laughs> your maiden name, uh, Valerie Adams to Jamie Garvin and um, to uh, uh, former school board chair, Susanna Mizelhub and current school board chair, Heather Altenberg. 
And um, to Matthew Sturgis, thank you. Uh, the Finance Subcommittee is probably the most uh, relevant and useful meeting I attend every month, so thank you. On to the presentation, here we go. So we're going to move to the first quote. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So why are we here? Why do we do this? Um, Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And our second president of the United States, John Adams, said, liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. <clears throat> High quality public education is essential to democracy and the future of humanity is a resource for all and a down payment on the future. So um, what I'm going to do tonight, we've, we've sort of begun, I'm going to walk the, board, the uh, town council through our process because what I believe is that the town council really wants to be able to validate that the school board has had a rigorous, repeatable and transparent process. So it'll be fairly similar to last year's presentation with um, relevant updates. First of all, we have um, pre-budget uh, yeah, pre development work. We had year-round finance subcommittee meetings, which I referred to earlier. Um, and although it seems like it was so long ago, just this past fall, the needs assessment was completed and that report was delivered to the school board. Um, the building committee was formed based on that report and the building committee began work. Um, monthly budget updates from the business manager. Our new business manager gives us um, incredibly concise and useful budget updates every month. And then we have four, basically because of our superintendent and our new business manager, we have constant intense study and seeking of revenues and savings. Um, some examples of that are the SRRF project fund, the reimbursement for out of district students and state funded bus purchase. And quickly, if Marcy would be willing to just talk about those a little bit, how they were, um, they're found money. Oh, yes, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so we have had a, a, a lucky year. Our SRRF funds, our um, school revolving renovation funds, were awarded by the state. We were awarded six projects, and the total amount of all six awards came to $390,429. And the great part about this is that it's a 30% forgiveness of this amount, which comes to $117,120 nine dollars as a grant and the remaining amount is zero percent financing over five years so it's a great way for us to be able to get those projects for the buildings and the second item that elizabeth talked about the bus award grant is basically we were given money to purchase a bus this in this new year um, and we will be going through the process of getting the specifications for the bus and the award money will be given to us through our state funds and will be reimbursed completely to purchase a new bus. And then the other item that you mentioned, Elizabeth, was... Oh, can you... Nasser, can, what was that? Okay. Um, the third item was the subsidizable educational costs for uh, reimbursing us for some of our students that we have that are out of district students that come from other districts that receive higher amount of subsidy. So we were given by the state um, $75,675.72 for these students. And this, this money will be in our um, final check in June. So we will get this money for this fiscal year. Thanks, Marcy. And the reason I bring this up is all of this is not um, just sort of given to us as if a fairy sprinkled it. These had these all these things had to be thought out and researched and um, 
deliberately gone after. The superintendent became aware that the first time in uh, my memory, I don't know the last time that the state opened the SRRF, um, but she became aware back around the 4th of July and because we were in the process of completing our needs assessment, we were able to um, make those applications. Uh, in the same way, our business manager has been just scouring everything having to do with school funding and looking for anything. Um, it's sort of akin to shaking the trees and lifting up the sofa cushions. Every single nickel that could be available for Cape Elizabeth, it seems like Marcy Weeks has been going after. So we appreciate that in our pre-budget uh, development work. Good comment. Oh, did someone have something to say? Yep. Uh, uh, quick comment. Uh, I just wanted to commend you guys on this particular component of the budget. Uh, one of the areas that I've seen in need of improvement over the last few years uh, was I, I wanted to see that the district was going and seeking out revenue uh, from as many possible sources as they could before they started going to the taxpayers. And uh, from my perspective, I've, uh, I feel like we've made significant strides uh, as demonstrated with these categories. So uh, just want to commend you on this one component um, because that, that's what I had been looking for is try, try to get revenue from other sources before coming to the taxpayers. And this is one of those components. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And it's really been due to the leadership of the superintendent and our new business manager. The board could not be more pleased. Um, so the last part of pre-budget development work uh, was our yearly audit of school finances done by RKO. I believe that the town council is aware of um, the outcome of that and um, we can say that the, the skinnier the, um, the folder you receive, the better the news and our, you know, our bound portfolio was very skinny this year so that felt great. And again, um, thank you to RKO and to John Q and Marcy for that. So to the next slide. Oops, come on. Just a moment, Madam Chair. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. It went to sleep on me. Sorry. <laughs> Also this year, we had negotiations with two of our um, uh, major bargaining units, the, the largest group being the teachers union, and that was just completed as of last week. Uh, we completed negotiations and approved the contract for the administrators earlier this year. Um, I can give you a few of the details of the completed and approved contract in that um, the administrators group agreed to a three-year contract with modest salary increases. And we also were able to implement a new health insurance cost saving mechanism where we are incentivizing them to uh, choose to find their health insurance elsewhere so that we are not paying for their health insurance. And that was um, very popular on the school board side and popular with the administrators. Um, because the teacher's contract has not been ratified by the association or approved by the school board, we can't talk about it yet. But those were two major um, budget um, items. So we're happy to have those in the rear view mirror for now. So moving on. At the beginning of every single budget meeting, um, I had quite a spiel. Some people may have watched and, and heard it, but I'm going to read our uh, fiscal year 21 budget goals because we felt this was part of having our rigorous, repeatable, and transparent process is holding up our uh, budget goals to every decision we made. So maintain and improve the high quality of education for every student. Careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Support the 2020 through 2025 strategic plan goals and clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. So we did refer to goals in our goals. 
um, what I can tell you, and, and most of you may remember this, that our strategic plan is um, a highlight of our community and school department priorities for the next five years. Our current strategic plan goals were adopted in the fall of 2019 following a community forum of over 100 people. And that was a wide spectrum of participants. We had, oh, we had community members from all walks of life. We had parents, we had faculty, we had staff, students, administrators, board members. Um, it was just a very, very wide um, group of people. The, the thoughts and aspirations and concerns from that large gathering were distilled into these goals, which you see in front of you. Health and well-being, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facilities, and environmental responsibility. So it seems like years ago, but it was just a, months ago in January 2020, we began our budget workshops. We had five planned budget workshops and we wound up with seven actual workshops. But at our very first budget workshop, all building principals and department heads presented based on their original request budget. And I'm going to refer at this time quickly to just, um, I'm gonna look at the cost center review for the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. It was one of the documents that was shared ahead of time. Um, it just to have, so that you have an understanding of, of what was presented to the board. So you can see at the, at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School, there's a breakdown of the, the student population. Um, next year, the middle school is expected to have fewer students. And so below that, you will see in their staffing for next year, they have uh, reduced their staffing by one teacher. And then on the other side, you can see that there are needs addressed in this budget, and then there are needs that not, are not addressed. This is the um, original cost center review, and you can see it has a date of January 14th, 2020 not necessarily uh, everything from everybody's original uh, request budget cost and a review is supported in the final budget but this is the starting point you can also look at the cape elizabeth special education department cost center review and you can be um i would say about 100 percent sure that everything on the special education cost center review has to be supported um, and mandated by law so that you can see exactly who makes up the special ed department and later we can talk about the fact that they also have facilities needs that are unaddressed. So we had those cost center reviews showing enrollment, staffing needs, needs not met, needs addressed, that sort of thing. And at the end of that presentation, I asked for uh, the school board and the public to please submit questions based on that original request budget. And um, those questions were compiled and shared with the school board, the town council. They were shared out to administrators so that they could uh, research their answers and get them out to all of us. And they are also posted online. Can I make a quick comment? Sure. Uh, so uh, with respect to the Cape Elizabeth High School's call center review, uh, I just really, really, really wanted to commend you for this particular document. Uh, much, uh, one of my primary focuses of critique over the last uh, couple of years has been, uh, I've, I've wanted to see constant uh, improvement. I said, Rome's not built today. I want to see constant improvement in the process in a review of things that I deemed kind of necessary for review. And this document is the first time to my knowledge the information that was truly needed to make an informed decision as me as a voter on the school budget, uh, but for everyone involved, this document, the high school cost center review document, specifically the last few pages, was the first time I've ever seen this information, which is what I'd always wanted to see, which allows me to make an informed decision with respect to a lot of uh, a number of these issues. So I just really wanted to commend you for this document. And just as a voter, 
of a general voter of, in town, I would love to see this similar document every single year. <laughs> um, so that's it. Thank you, Chris. I, uh, I also agree with you. I strive to improve uh, our process every year and my thanks go out to um, high school principal Jeff Shedd who prepared that high school cost center review and um, we have that similar information for our Pond Cove and middle school. So my wish, although I will not be finance chair forever and you can bet on that, is that uh, this process will be documented and as, as I keep saying, I want it to be rigorous and repeatable. And so that, you know, when we've made these improvements that we will continue to do that. So thank you. Um, we're going to move on to revenue now. So this year, our state estimate shows an increase of $36,350. That is good news. However, we are still trying to recover from three consecutive years of um, cumulative revenue cuts. So um, it was a cumulative cut of $2,156,000 uh, $2, between fiscal year 17, 18, and 19. Um, in fiscal year 20, which was this, this, this current year's budget, we did receive a $407,000 increase which really still puts us about 1.8 million in the hole. So we are still recovering from this. I'm going to, um, if, if people have the state education subsidy general purpose aid chart that was shared, it has these green bars on it. It helps give you a sense of where we have been and where we are. The uh, 2021 number is not on there because these are actuals. And as we are all well aware, um, we don't know exactly yet what our actual will be, but we do have our estimate. So moving on. And the reason I dropped revenues into this part is I'm trying to give the, the town council sort of a linear view of how we uh, receive information as well. We actually start the budget well before we ever know what our revenues will be. And so um, we feel like we have to be very uh, thoughtful and careful with trying to develop expenditures without, not, without knowing what state aid will be. So state aid comes in um, in February and then... Um, we kind of keep going with our process. So one of the unknowns is known now at our, in our uh, process. In February of 2020, we also um, wanted to repeat another, um, what we found to be an important um, understanding of developing our budget, which is understanding the essential programs and services and the ED 279 state aid estimate. And um, it's, I, I, I just myself and I think the business administrator and the superintendent, we all agree that just because we feel that it's necessary to fund above EPS, we can't just simply disregard EPS. We need to understand it and maximize what we can get out of it. So our business administrator prepared a document for all of us, which is shared with you that talks about um, what the ED 279 is and um, when it is released. Essentially, it is um, the one piece of data that we are interested in every year and it's right around the, it's a, the adjusted state contribution. So the full ED 279 is a large document I did share with you and if you are interested, you're welcome to go through it. Um, it has, you know, multiple different categories and levers, but um, in the end, what we really need to to, to focus in on is um, section five, which is where we find our state subsidy. What happens is that the, the, the total amount is calculated and then the state has a way of um, trying, you know, assuming what each town can afford to raise towards that subsidy. And that's uh, why, you know, their total calculation has a subtraction and then whatever is left is what our subsidy winds up being. So um, kind of long-winded, you're welcome to read that document, but that is why this, for this upcoming fiscal year, we are estimated to receive $36,321 more. Taking a look at um, 
teacher uh, teaching staff comparisons and essential programs and services. We wanted to look at um, other towns. Are we the only town that funds above EPS? Uh, what are you know what are the comparisons in our own neighborhood and then statewide? So there's a chart that looks like this. It says teaching staff comparisons FY21. And if you look at it, you'll see that um, Yarmouth is about 14% over EPS. South Portland is about 14% over EPS. Scarborough is at 19% over EPS. Uh, RSU 51, which is Cumberland and North Yarmouth are 28% over EPS. Falmouth is 28% above EPS and Cape Elizabeth is pretty closely tied, it looks like, with Scarborough at about 20%. So that's sort of, it was a snapshot about what, what do our neighbors do in, in a lot of the schools that we are typically compared with. And then another um, study, we looked at um, EPS calculations and um, it's, it's difficult to look at elementary and middle school because different schools have different grades but we can get a good snapshot at the high school level because that's something that's standard pretty much throughout the state. Um, what we did find out is that um, EPS calculates funding based on high school student rate, high school to student teacher ratio of about 16. And this is in a documented study. Actual student to teacher ratio for all of Maine high schools is 14.6. 78% of all Maine high schools are below the EPS student to teacher ratio, meaning they fund above EPS as we do. And the average actual student to teacher ratio in Maine's low poverty, high performing schools is 13.1. So low poverty, high performing, those are similar school departments to ours. Cape Elizabeth High School student to teacher ratio is 13.5, which exceeds the statewide average for comparable schools. So we, you know, we had a pretty in-depth EPS conversation. And then um, at that meeting, we also started having written answers uh, distributed from all the uh, questions earlier submitted. So those questions were delivered at, I mean, those answers were delivered at the workshops. They were also posted online. This was a recurring part of every subsequent workshop until we had worked through all the answers and, and any new questions that we received. And um, I think it can help the town council and the community understand that the school board does not just rubber stamp whatever is presented with us. I feel like um, we are, we, we put people, through the grinder a little bit. So let's, we're gonna take a look at the Pond Cove School 2020 to 2021 budget questions and answers. And um, one of the positions that the Pond Cove principal had requested in his original request budget was um, a guidance counselor. So currently there's one guidance counselor at Pond Cove and um, in his proposal, he's asking for a second guidance counselor. So there were several questions about um, why do we need another full-time guidance counselor? Um, what, what are the state standards around this? Um, what, what does EPS expect of us? Um, there was a lot of skepticism around adding that position. And what we found from asking those questions is that um, we have one guidance counselor serving well over 500 students and Falmouth Elementary School has one to 286 and Brown School in South Portland has one to 250. Dyer School in South Portland has one to 238 and on and on. I think you can look at these charts and see where I'm going. Um, we are very far outside our peer group and we are not within um, range of even what EPS expects. EPS um, supports us having two guidance counselors. So that was, that was interesting for us to learn. But at the same time, there was also um, a position asked for called a permanent substitute. And there was a, there was a lot of questioning around that. Um, 
we wanted to know, you know, why, you know, what other local school departments have a permanent substitute? Is it tied to just one school? What is the cost of this? And, and you know, you know, what would this permanent substitute do on days when no teacher is absent? And the, the questioning around this was really rigorous. And uh, the outcome, I think, showed that, that having, having this questioning helps the administrators think and rethink and scrutinize their own budgets because before the school board asked for any revisions to be brought back, that particular position was uh, pulled out of the budget. Um, I'm gonna, we can take another peek at um, another, just a quick look at questions and answers for the um, Director of Teaching and Learning. There were a lot of questions around our English learner population. We have had a growing English learner population. And so we wanted to, to make sure that we had an adequate understanding of our current and incoming English learner needs because over this past school year, we've we had to increase the teaching staff supporting English learners. And um, we want to make sure that we have the best understanding that we can about those incoming students. Um, so there's a pretty lengthy answer. This is in the FY21 school board budget questions for Kathy Stankard. Um, and essentially, you know, that sh she feels that we have an adequate understanding of the needs of, of these students that we have, but, you know, incoming students is somewhat of a question mark every year. But those are students that we are, you know, I like to say this, we're mandated to serve them, but we, you know, you want to do it because it's the right thing to do and because you have to do it. So those are a couple of responses. Um, we had a, a quick look at the high school questions and answers. And we wanted to remind people that we cut or absorbed positions last year because we expected roughly 511 students at the high school. And we actually had closer to 530 or 540, which means that there are several classes that are um, really above school board guidelines and um, they had to bring desks in, they're really crowded. And so we really wanted to kind of scrutinize why we're adding partial positions and we aren't adding 13 positions. I'd like to dispel that myth, but we are adding, um, you know, a 0.75 science teacher and, a, and you know, 0.4 French teacher, things like that. The expectation is that we will be um, up 8.7% in enrollment at the high school next year and the increase in staff is roughly 8%. So you can look at the um, questions and answers for the high school and anybody else that you wanna look at. So we'll move on. Next, we talked about staffing and enrollment. Um, at our March 3rd, 2020 workshop, knowing that staffing and enrollment is the major budget driver in all school departments. Um, it's not something to be shied away from. It's something to be examined under a very bright spotlight. Um, about 84% of our budget is related to staffing costs. And just recently, I think this afternoon, we had the uh, most up-to-date pie chart that you can see. It is roughly 84% is costs associated with um, staffing. So we had to stop and think to ourselves, why do we staff our schools the way we do? Essentially, it comes down to the needs of students, primarily the number of students and the distribution of students. So number one, we have policy. And I will, we do have the school board policy in here. I will also note another uh, myth I'd like to dispel. The school board revisited, and it's stamped right on the school board policy, revisited uh, the class size policy last time, December 8th in 2015. I was on the board at that time. There were no changes made. And um, there is, uh, what, what we did change was range instead of hard numbers. So we have policy that guides us in class size and in teacher load because in the middle school and the high school, there is a, there, you really need to look at teacher load because it's not, those teachers aren't just seeing one group for the entire day. They may have a, you know, classes of varying sizes, but the, the teacher load is really what 
is um, essential to be paying attention to for them. So we have our class size and teacher load policy that helps us determine our class sizes. And then we have to think about our student to regular ed teacher ratios and the range of our local and northern New England peers. So we have some research on that in a document shared. So if you look at the supplemental fact sheet to Cape Elizabeth High School's cost center summary and you jump down, so our student to teacher ratio is on par with nearby comparison schools and higher than many high performing schools. And our current student to teacher ratio is 13.5, as I noted earlier. Now, I'd like to, I, I think people kind of have a misunderstanding about that because 13.5 does not mean that that is, you know, most of your classes, not at all. Mo it, many of these classes are, you know, well over 20 students. But if you look below, because we need to just, we, we can't just look at our neighbors, we need to look around. If you look into Massachusetts, Maine, and New Hampshire at their different class size ratios, and these are for essentially comparable schools, you can see that we do not fall in the low range. We, we fall on the higher side. So our average student load per teacher is about 84 students. And if most teachers teach five classes, five times 18 0.6 is how you get to 84 students. This compares to the school board guideline of 75 to 90 students for teacher load. So um, we don't have to go through this. I think this is the document that um, Chris Straw is most excited about. I'm excited about it too. We're partners in this. It shows the um, class size and student load of all teachers at the high school. And the reason I wanted to make note of this is um, the reason why the school board is supporting adding um, a 0.75 ma uh, uh, science teacher and a couple of other um, part-time positions. If you, if you just scan through, you will see that there are several math classes that are in the mid to upper 20s, approaching 30. You have some science teachers that are in the mid 20s to upper 20s and these you know these are classes that have to have labs we have limited seating and safety concerns when you get classes over a certain number so and i think i matt may be behind me we're on policy enrollment and there we are <laughs> um so we when talking about staffing it's not just the numbers if it was just as easy as taping taking the full number and dividing it by a certain number of classrooms and then putting the students in there, I think all principals jobs would be so much easier, but that is really not the case at all. Staffing is driven by needs. And how do we define needs? So we're gonna move on to mandates and goals. Mandates are laws that require programs and services for students. Many or most of them are unfunded. Mandates have increased over the years. So I think we've often heard this um, conversation. If our enrollment is gently declining over the years, you know, why do we have more teachers? Why, why do we have the, the, the number of um, staff kind of creeping up? And I shared this with the town council last year. It is still as relevant as ever and it is a linear timeline. I can't even get the whole thing in. It starts in 1900 and it goes all the way through the 2000s and this is just federal mandates. This is, this is not local mandate. Um, so a lot of these mandated mandates are unfunded and they are all required. A lot of us um, remember when the race to the top came online. We remember when Common Core came in. We remember when STEM programs were first coming online. But now we also have anti-harassment programs. We have internet safety. We have texting and social media education. We have child trafficking education. We have 
marijuana safety, cyberbullying, opiate addiction. We have all these different mandates and all these different things that need to, and these are, a lot of these are regular ed, so they need to be pushed into classrooms, regular ed across the board, and they are not coming from, you know, special ed or that sort of thing. These are, these are, you know, school-wide that these are programs that have to be staffed, developed, and taught. So it's, um, and they're ever increasing, you know, the list goes on and it gets added to every single year, the different mandates. Um, at the same time, we have, so we have the special ed requirements, which we absolutely must fund by law. No, you know, it doesn't matter if there's a, a pandemic or not, these needs have to be met. And we also have um, RTI, which I don't know that everybody understands, but it's called response to intervention, which is for essentially regular ed students who aren't accessing, who aren't able to, or not supposed to access special ed, they, but they're struggling. And so there are different tiers or levels of support and intervention that are put in for these students um, to help them meet their goals and succeed. And th that mandate for RTI, again, it's one of those things that I, you know, we have to do, but it's the right thing to do. We don't want to leave students behind. That takes staffing, that takes programming, and that also takes space. Um, at the, we can also say that we have a um, gifted and talented program, which you know, kind of services students on the other end of that spectrum. Again, it takes staffing, it takes space. So we, you know, we have to be able to serve all our students. Um, then we also have a community history and continued expectation of high performing schools. Year after year after year, our um, citizens have overwhelmingly supported our schools. And when you talk to incoming, well, not necessarily incoming families, but I've talked to um, real estate agents and asked them about, you know, what are the things that people are saying when they move to Cape Elizabeth? And the number one attribute they mention is the high performing schools. They move here for the schools. So, and that was reiterated in our future search. I would say that no one said I'd like mediocre schools and no one ever says, let's be less successful. Um, and we do have a rich history. We have been named the US Department of Education Blue Ribbon High School on multiple occasions. We've been named the top STEM high school in Maine among traditional high schools. Um, obviously the um, STEM school up north got number one for all schools, but we were number one for traditional schools. We've had numerous music awards for our school department, including this year, and we've had numerous athletic championships that this community is incredibly proud of. Another topic is the undesignated or unassigned fund balance. On March 11th, 2020, we talked about the unassigned fund balance. So what is that? Um, at the end of our fiscal year, anything that is left over, um, any project that came in under budget, any teacher that we hired at a lower pay grade, replacing a teacher at a higher pay grade, anything like that, anything left over that we didn't spend out of contingency, that gets moved into unassigned funds. How is it used? So I think in the past there has been some confusion about the unassigned fund balance because, um, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the town side also has a similar fund that is able to be accessed throughout the year. However, on the school side, the unassigned fund balance may only be accessed once. We may, in our budget development, use um, funds from the unassigned fund balance and we may move them into our revenues to help lower the tax burden. Um, we may not access it any other time during the school year. It's not a contingency fund. We can't reach into it. And um, if you look at the, this is my favorite spreadsheet. I'll be coming back to it multiple times. It should be your favorite too, everybody. It's called Budget Tax Implications FY21 Spreadsheet. This shows the history of, um, well, a lot of things, but we're gonna be looking at the use of unassigned fund balance. So going back to the 2016-2017 school year, you can see that 
At that time, we, were able, we used $450,000 of the unassigned fund balance to try to lower the tax impact. If you look at the, um, and, and, you can, and you're gonna see why, if you look up, you'll see something in red, the negative $730,000 in state revenues. In the next school year, the next budget year, 2017, 2018, you'll see that we used $350,000 or we used $800,000 rather of unassigned funds because we received um, about a half a million state aid reduction. The next year, um, it was clear that our unassigned fund balance was um, starting to go down. We had another state reduction in funds, 899,000. We used 400,000 of unassigned funds. So we had a pretty healthy unassigned fund balance and we're doing our best to use it to lower tax impact for those years. And then going into the 2019, 2020, budget year, it became clear that we needed to, as hard as it was, we needed to try to start building our fund balance back up. We used 300,000 last year and we will be using 400,000 this year. But the conversation is really about what are the recommendations around um, the amount of the unassigned fund balance because it is incredibly dangerous to let it get too low. Then we won't have what we need to really help out in support of our budget and lower the tax impact for our neighbors. So um, we talked about this during our budget audit. We talked about this again during our um, March 11th uh, budget workshop. And the, the general wisdom is anywhere from one to 2% of your operating budget is uh, a good goal for your fund balance and it is capped at 3% by the state. And if, if I step out of line, I want John Q or Marcy to step in and say, no, you're wrong. Um, but I believe that if a school department goes over 3%, you um, get in big trouble. I don't know if you have to spend it down or if you get penalized, but I know it's not good. So at our March 11th meeting, we talked about um, we made a goal for replenishment where we don't want to overuse the unassigned funds um, in an irresponsible way. We wanna make sure that we are keeping it at a healthy level and have it there to move over into our budget in small increments as needed. So that was a lot of our conversation at the March 11th business meeting. We had further answers to budget questions and um, then we had some deliberation. And at that time, the, the original request budget um, did not seem like it was the right budget to bring forward to the town council. And so the school board asked the superintendent to bring revised budget options with lower expenditure increases back to the board at our next meeting. So. On March 24th, 2020, the superintendent delivered three budget revisions for school board consideration. And revisions included cuts to proposed projects, programs, and staffing, as well as a lower budgeted health insurance increase. Now I'll talk about this a little bit. So again, just like not knowing about our state revenue, um, which although we do find out about that pretty early on in the process, the health insurance increase comes fairly late in the process. So we usually drop a pretty high uh, number in there just as a cushion. You never wanna drop a number in there that's lower than the actual. So we budgeted 10% uh, for an increase. And at that time, we found out that the state range was going to be capped at 6%. So that was um, time for some celebration. So uh, that was built into the um, expenditure reduction scenarios. And um, the, but the, the board had some very careful, deliberate conversation about what was cut out of the budget to reach each of those scenarios. And then after careful analysis, 6% um, budget increase really was able to meet our goals. Um, it actually was able to get down to 5.95% spending. So 
some of the things, if you look at, and I'm going to refer back to this sheet as well, this is the FY 2020-2021 budget changes to reflect a 5.9% increase. This was updated on um, April 7th. So there were a few things that were reduced before we asked the superintendent to bring us um, reduced expenditures. Like I mentioned earlier, after um, the question and answer period, which is a, a very um, rigorous period for the board and the administrators to go over everything, the, the permanent substitute at Pond Cove had already been removed. The facilities project manager had already been removed and um, the middle school classroom teacher uh, position that was going to be absorbed, you know, was, was already in the budget. So there were reductions and changes to get to that 5.95% increase. And there were uh, those cuts included um, cutting the band room project projector and audio system, uh, changing from laptops to Chromebooks to reduce the, the outlay. The stair treads at Pond Cove will not be replaced. We will not have new whiteboards installed. Ca uh, carpet in the high school main office will not be replaced. We were going to uh, potentially purchase a van because there is a, um, a, a van that died. So we're going to lease that van instead. There's an elimination of a high school English slash literacy teacher or, uh, and elective teachers. There's um, an elimination of a 0.5 teacher leader coordinator. Uh, there's an eliminated 0.5 nurses assistant, um, eliminated, oh, sorry, changed athletic grounds teacher from an FT, uh, partial FTE to an hourly position. Um, there was a change uh, to an EdTech 1 uh, position in the library at half time as opposed to EdTech 2 full time. Uh, we were lucky to hear about that health insurance ceiling going from 10% down to 6%. And then before this was delivered to us on April 7th, we learned our actual increase was 5.95%. So we had that reduction in um, those, those projects and positions were all cut from the original request budget. Um, the, hey, Elizabeth, it's Jamie. Can I just interrupt you for one second? Because sure. because there was a question or a comment that was made during the public comment period and you just went, went past um, that specific position, I just wanted to call attention to it. Okay. Um, I, somebody from the public, I think it was uh, Ms. Townsend said, was questioning the addition of uh, an assistant for the athletics department mm -hmm. um, when there might not be sports being played, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you had just pointed out, and, and I assume I'm correct in, in presuming that with the shift of this recommendation to be an hourly position, if there's no hours being worked, there's no cost incurred, correct? Correct. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm trying to go quickly because I don't want to keep everybody uh, here. No, that's fine. I only wanted <laughs> to call it out. In my office all night. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I only wanted to call it out because there was a direct question from the public right. about it. So and I appreciate you. that, Jamie. And there's, I mean, there's a trickiness in this. There might be athletics in the fall, there might not. It's hard to know. Um, Obviously, there's going to be great, um, we're going to conduct all hiring with um, an eye to the future and, you know, positions may not be filled. It, hours may not be worked. It's hard to know at this time. Um, so if we're going to move on a little bit lower to the equipment and positions that are included in the FY21 budget. Um, there really are not 13 positions. Um, I did try to do a little quick calculation to the side. Um, we are adding a 0.4 FTE French teacher, 0.75 science teacher, 0.6 math teacher. Those are 100% um, cannot underline that enough enrollment driven. Um, we had an expectation of 511 students at the high school this year. For whatever reason, um, more students showed up back at the high school, either in the sophomore class or in the freshman class than were expected. And um, those classes are quite big, a lot of them. And so we are understaffed now and we're expecting um, quite a few more students at the high school this year. So on top of the um, overly big enrollment this year. So we're the, the high school is really targeting 
the math department and the science department, as well as a small addition to the French, uh, the world language department. Um, the, there's a high school 0.5 library ed tech, and um, that is really 100% due to the fact that the, uh, the current high school librarian was hired under very different circumstances, because that's one of the things we ask. If you're asking for help for the librarian, what has changed? Why, why does she need this now? And she had full-time ed tech support when she was hired here. That support is gone and her job duties, you know, had to pick up the person that was gone and have increased on top of that. So um, we also have um, kind of a remolding of a current position called the Extended Learning Opportunities Coordinator Salaries and Benefits. That's a wash. There, there are um, subtractions in the budget to um, ameliorate that addition to the budget. The current position is a, um, it's kind of a funny position. It's not a teacher position. It has um, volunteer coordinator. I like check, you know, making sure people have their volunteer training and their fingerprints and all that sort of thing. Um, so the, the volunteer coordinator side of that's going to go to the high school and this position, I'm uh, not the high school, the um, central office. And due to cutting back on some other positions, that extended learning opportunities coordinator can become a full teaching position. Um, we're can adding, I, a, oh. It's Heather, can I just add one thing? Can I interrupt for one second or no? You, I just wanna bring back to the point to all the part-time math the part-time math and science teacher um, due to the enrollment coming in that's going to bubble up. We have a large eighth grade class that's coming in that you're talking about supporting and I just want to reiterate that in the middle school we're absorbing a retirement. So a position will be reduced in the middle school but needs to be taken up in the high school. I just I just thought that was important to you to add to what you're saying. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. No problem. Um, so if you do add up those enrollment driven um, high school teachers, it's uh, 1.75 uh, actual new positions that are enrollment driven. So if we move to uh, Pong Cove, we have another enrollment driven um, classroom teacher. We have a smaller fourth grade moving into the middle school and we have a bigger fourth grade coming next year, which means we need to hire a teacher to stay within our um, guidelines. We also have the aforementioned guidance counselor, which um, kind of as a surprise to me was uh, supported by EPS and um, by our, our peer schools. We, are, we have one guidance counselor um, serving so many children. Um, we have a special services, services um, ed tech, which is mandated by law to meet the needs of a special ed student. Um, we have a facilities night shift maintenance position, which if uh, council would like to, um, at the end of this presentation, ask Perry a little bit about, um, he can speak to it, but it is an incredibly necessary position. And you might see something kind of funny. There's a facilities custodian that is in here for just the town side. And I know, I think most town councilors understand this, but for the public, all um, custodians are actually school employees, even though some of them work just in school, some of them work in town buildings and school buildings, and some of them just work in town buildings. However, they have to be part of the school expenditures, and then the town will um, basically reimburse the school department for the cost of that employee. So there's a facilities custodian. Originally, there had been two facilities custodians. Um, one of those was um, cut earlier, but we're uh, still trying to recover. We're still trying to um, add that facilities custodian. And my understanding is that the sanitization and cleaning of the buildings is really never been more important than it is right now. And the custodians are still working quite hard. We have um, that athletics assistant that Jamie mentioned at a, a 595 hour, hours. It's an hourly rate, so that person doesn't work. That person is not paid. And then we have the uh, middle school indoor track coach. Again, if we don't offer a track program, you know, there is some conversation to be had there. We have a lease of, new of a new maintenance van, which was the aforementioned um, you know, possible purchase. 
and then we have some double robotics equipment. So as you can see, if you do a little addition, the, the total cut from the original request budget and it represented here is 534,899. That is cut from the original um, budget. This current budget we're presenting is a 5.95% increase in expenditures with a tax impact of 5.3% at this time. We're still sort of uh, moving linearly. At that time, that tax increase was still below the average of the previous three years. So then in April, mid-April, the school board voted at its April business meeting after an extensive review period, which began in January, spanning pre and post COVID-19 reality. Um, after months of public meetings with structured agendas and careful goal-oriented focus, the board is proud of the FY21 school department budget. We felt like that budget met the needs of our students um, because their needs don't change when our circumstances change. We still, the students still come to us, we still have to educate them. So something very different happened. Um, in April 21, 2020, we had an unprecedented special business meeting after we had already adopted the budget. We convened to further scrutinize the budget in lieu of the COVID-19 pandemic and attending uncertainties and we were able to adopt a new version of the budget with a lower tax impact. Expenditures were once again measured against our goals. We had to be absolutely certain that what we were bringing forward was what we really absolutely predicted we would need to serve our students. There was a great deal of uncertainty that we discussed and at this time I'm hoping Donna will talk a little bit about the two different scenarios we might face in the fall around uncertainties. Sure. So many of the comments and concerns we have received have expressed the reality that the FY21 school budget process began in one time pre-pandemic and has now entered another time pandemic reality. This is a correct statement and as we examine two pictures of what the future might bring it becomes evident that even the proposed FY21 school budget may not begin to address the needs that we will quite likely have, regardless of which scenario develops. So thinking about what our students are going through now um, in some homes, and, and they're going through very, very different situations in their homes. In some homes, parents are working at home and at the same time trying to support their students um, academically. We have essential worker parents and students are in either in a daycare or with family members that might not be able to provide academic support. We have some of our older students caring for their younger siblings, students, while parents work and those students don't have time to do their own work because they're busy taking care of their siblings. We have students who normally need additional supports based on their needs who haven't been receiving the same degree of those additional supports. We have students with prior social emotional needs who haven't been receiving the same degree of support. We have students with newly surfacing social emotional needs based on the challenges and traumas of these times. And in worst case scenarios, but we know this is happening, we have evidence, we have students who are experiencing physical and emotional abuse that have not been detected while they have been home. So we have to recognize that our students are in very different situations and experiencing um, very different things as we uh, are in the present remote learning situation. So we have really two different scenarios. Um, there might be more um, in the coming days, but the first one is that we'd like to think about is um, if we return to our classrooms in the fall of 2020. So our teachers and our director of teaching and learning, Kathy Stank Stanker, will be working to identify end of the year academic benchmarks for students in these challenging times. 
it's important in teaching that you identify where your students are, what they know and can do so that you can meet, meet them where they are and then move forward. Uh, based on that important premise of teaching, when our students return to the classroom, um, we, aren't, we aren't sure where they will be. Um, we would quite likely need staff for administering end of the year student assessments that would normally have been administered the previous spring to determine where the students are. We might need staff for supporting students who are not meeting those teacher identified benchmarks. Um, quite likely that will be the case for many students. We need staff to support students who are experiencing emotional trauma based on their experiences during the pandemic. Uh, we need staff to investigate concerns regarding home situations that surface when students return. Um, and special education staff for attending IEP meetings and adjusting individual education plans based on student gaps that have surfaced during remote learning. So those are some of the needs that we quite possibly will face as we return to school. Then scenario two, and nobody wants to think about this, but what if we do uh, continue with remote learning in the fall of 2020? Um, ad additional support will be needed. Student support po poses an even greater challenge should we need to continue with remote learning in the fall. Teachers, interventionists, and special education supporters are simply not able to provide the same level of support that we can provide when our students are in school. And some of our students are not having great success with online learning. Many of these students will quite likely need increased support requiring more support staff. Director of Special Services Del Peavy reports that we would probably need an additional one to two educational technicians at each school to provide additional support to our special education staff should the remote learning situation run into the next school year. And these staff aren't in our school budget. Food services, and this has been um, a huge um, a huge thing to tackle as our students have been um, at home. Currently, we're feeding over 70 students. Our nutrition services department workers are preparing boxes of food that are delivered by Chief Fenton, Dave Galvin, and Darren Estes from the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. The food is being funded through the National School Lunch Program. We have two $500 grants through Full Plates. We have a $500 grant from CEF and many, many citizen donations. And we want to thank everybody for their donations. Um, as well as the local funding that, that supports our school lunch program. Several grant applications for which Peter Esposito, um, Nutrition Services Director has applied, have been denied due to the depletion of funds. So we are running into organizations that have used all their funds. Peter reports that it would be difficult at the current time to predict the cost of continuing to deliver food to families throughout next year. There are many factors to consider such as, will we get more people? Will we be able to continue with the current waiver from the National School Lunch Program? Will our food supply uh, source be interrupted? Currently, we are having some challenges um, getting some goods. Uh, we do have, uh, through our um, greater, uh, schools, uh, greater Sebago Schools Education uh, Association, we are trying to, uh, we're, we're involved in a co-op, and we're trying to finalize our bid process uh, so that we can get the best bids and the best pricing. Uh, technology is a concern. Our district is fortunate in that most of our families do have internet connections um, and many have multiple devices at home. But what we're learning from families is that although they may have multiple devices, uh, they also have multiple people in their families that need to use those devices at the same time. So uh, talking to um, Noel Harf, Director of Technology, uh, should remote learning continue, uh, he recommends that we would need to purchase more iPads so that all Pond Cove students have access to iPad uses at home. So suggesting a three-year lease, and he does say that he doesn't like lease, uh, lease um, opportunities, but three-year lease of approximately 320 iPads, which would cost about $6,000 a year. Another huge concern that we have is the uh, condition that many of our devices that have been distributed um, 
what what will be the condition where when they return to the technology team this summer um, to date we absorb most of the costs for technology repair and we do have twelve thousand dollars in the budget for those repairs however um, Noel predicts that we're probably facing another additional eight thousand um, dollars of repairs we don't know which scenario we'll be experiencing in the fall, or there may even be a third scenario that we haven't even thought of. Um, but what we anticipate is that whatever the scenario, it will most likely put a strain on the budget that we do have proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, my understanding is that we also um, have bought some mobile hotspots to help out some families who don't have internet access. So we have absorbed that cost. And for um, counselors and the public that, you know, might not understand the challenges that some of these students are facing. Um, we have students who need, act, you know, physical support when they are in our buildings and they are not able to have that support at home. And so when they might have been functioning at a particular level when they were in school, they may return to us needing, you know, even a one on one support, which is costly. It's not in this budget and it might be what those students need. So there are just a lot of unknowns right now. So um, getting back to our kind of unprecedented post adoption meeting. Um, we we looked at our budget we we scrutinized that budget again we looked at that we looked at this this sheet again and we had conversation and those expenditures were upheld um, the other part of that meeting was new information from the town finance director that allowed the school board to increase the use of unassigned funds and thus lower the tax impact to 4.13 percent and one thing I would like to highlight is uh, thus far many of the communications from the uh, citizens at this time were referencing uh, expenditure increase. And so I want to make sure that people understand that, you know, the expenditure increase is not the same as the tax impact. And so um, Just again, we were able to use more unassigned funds. Um, than we had anticipated and we were able to lower this year, uh, this upcoming budget's tax impact to 4.13%. So if you go back to um, my absolute favorite spreadsheet, the budget tax implications FY21 spreadsheet, you go to the far right and the bottom column, you will see 4.13%. So we're moving on. We're getting so close to the end. Thank you for everybody hanging in there with me. Excuse me, Elizabeth, uh, yeah. you notice that uh, Chris has his hand up. Oh, I don't, but Chris, go for Sorry it. To interrupt. Sure, uh, I, I kind of just want to jump into the meat of it at this point. Um, but uh, that aside, uh, I just really was hoping that you could address uh, Donna's point because that, that's what the entire conversation for me is going to be over tonight and tomorrow if need be. Um, a lot of the public comment that we've had, a lot of the feedback we received by email has very astutely and very correctly noted, uh, this is a really, really bad economic situation we're facing. Um, and we all know that. Um, at the same time, we also do need to keep in mind that the last time I checked, NASDAQ is still 70% higher than it was five years ago. So. Yeah, it's a bad economic situation, but that affects some people and you can't look at the stock market because amortized over the five years, they're still up 12% a year or something like that. So if you're looking at stock investments, you're still doing pretty darn good over the last five years. But if you're looking at salary, you have a lot of people that are gonna have some real, really hard times in the very near future to the extent they're not already in that situation. So we've got this mess on the economic side, but what's been missing from the comments from the general public and from almost all of the, the emails that I've seen so far is uh, a, an acknowledgement um, in even if they do recognize this, it just hasn't been in the, in the feedback so far, in a recognition of exactly how big of an utter disaster our society is facing right now with respect to education. We, if you look at education as the great equalizer, the, the thing that allows people to move from one social strata to another, we've 
in modern times never ever had anything like this. The, the upheaval that is going on in these children's lives, it, we've never seen this in the last 50, 60 years. We, less, I, I, I did some, uh, yeah. I've, I, in, in my prior life, I dealt with some studies that looked at the fact that if a child even misses five days of school, it, it results in uh, adverse economic or adverse educational outcomes for them in the long run. Uh, those of you that are educators probably know this better than I do. That's five days of school. It's the reason why we focus on truancy. And although the school de department has done their best to deal with the situation, this, this is a disaster for education for these kids. And as much as I feel really bad for people like myself, where like, man, I've missed out on tens of thousands of dollars of income, it's gonna be really tough for these kids. This is unprecedented. This is the rest of their lives. Their education is just, is, is, it, it, they're gonna take a big, big, big hit. And as you noted, we're gonna need some serious response to intervention here come, come, uh, come fall. Uh, we're, gonna need a, we're gonna have to figure out, that there are gonna be kids who have languished, there's gonna be kids who have accelerated, they're just gonna be all over the map. And the school's gonna have to try to figure that out. So I guess the, the, what I really want to hear, and I don't know, and obviously the, the answer from you may be, we don't have an answer. We can't figure this out yet. What is the plan come fall? What, what, what I want to hear, what I want the voters to be handed by us is the voters can decide for themselves, what are, what are we capable of providing? Is, is this too much? Is this too little? What, what do we think we can, uh, what, what can we provide and the voters, from my perspective, need to look at that, and then they need to look at what is the actual need. And, I, I, and from my perspective, what we can provide is going down, and that sucks. But what we need, and the answer might be, you don't know this yet, and that sucks, and we're stuck with these schedules, and it just is what it is. But what we need, I fear what we need is going to be a whole lot more. And as you've noted, your budget is going to be, you get funding based on whatever goes to the voters and gets approved, and there isn't anything else. There, you don't have the ability, tell me if I'm wrong, but you don't have the ability to go back for a second request and say, wow, we thought we could get by with X, but oh my God, the disaster we have here where half of these kids are failing this grade and have to repeat fifth grade or seventh grade or whatever, you're gonna need the resources to deal with that. What happens if you don't have that money? What happens if you don't have the resources? What is the plan? And if the answer is you don't have a plan, I get it. Because this is a horrible situation, but we're gonna have to come up with a plan. And I would love to be able to tell the voters, this is how much the ideal response would be. I would, I would love to be able to hand to the voters, the school in their best guess, this is what the plan's gonna look like if we have to deal with this intervention issue. So absent that, um, with the budget that you have put forward, I view this as a pre-corona budget. Um, I understand you looked at it with the timing and everything, but I look at it as a pre-corona budget. Do you have the ability or can you, So, and then I'm gonna stop talking, do you have the ability to guess and say, wow, we're really, 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 we're gonna have to double or triple the number of people we have on RIT because we've half the class now isn't meeting math, math requirements and, um, do you have the ability to say, we're canceling all the football program, we're ca canceling lacrosse program, we're canceling soccer, we're canceling all these extracurriculars. It sucks, we feel bad for everyone that loves them and lives for them and this is what gives them th their meaning in life, these kids and keeps them motivated, but we have to cancel it and we're gonna shift all these resources to the core goal, the core focus, the core purpose of this education system, which is to make sure these kids know how to read, they know how to write and they know how to do their math. And Will you have the ability to shift the resources if need be? Will you be agile enough to do that? And then finally, last point, and then I'm going to shut up. I think back to, I think it was 2011, 2012, 2013. I look back to that budget, and for me, that was the one that, that was the straw that broke the camel's butt back. Uh, at the time, and I know some of you on this call, some of you that are still on the board, were involved in these budgets. Uh, there was a decision to cut the ed tax at Pond Cove. And instead, the resources were diverted somewhere else. And this is where I, I keep saying, like, the high school, we need to focus on the high school because you can't starve the young kids. You get more return on your investment by investing in small children than you do with middle schoolers and high schoolers. So I constantly say throw resources at Pond Cove. It's a better return on investment. But what we did is we cut the ed techs at Pond Cove. And there were a number of kids who were borderline uh, with math, and they fell below that line. And they've struggled ever since, and they haven't been able to catch up. And it ended up costing us, the taxpayers, a lot more in the long run because we were forced 
to set aside resources for RIT for those kids because they then now qualify for IEPs and the federal government says you have to spend these resources. So it cost us more in the long run because we were a penny shy pound foolish and we cut those ed techs that were needed in Pond Cove, whatever, was, whatever year that was, 2011, 2012, 2013, whatever it was. So I look back at that and that for me is like, this is what's gonna happen again. If we don't put the resources for this intervention that's gonna be coming down the line in the fall, we're gonna have a big problem. But I also recognize our ability to provide is not what it was. So we got to figure this out. And whether it's we have to slash these other services in order to be able to provide, or if being able to provide is going to require a 10% increase from what you have. I just, we need guidance. At least that's what I want to see is how much is it going to cost for us to, to have this? And I also recognize, and I'm going to shut up. I, said, I realized I said that already two or three times now. I also recognize this is a problem that CAPE is not alone in facing. This is something Maine and the entire country and the entire world is going to have to deal with. So I recognize the answer might be, we need Augusta, we need the federal government. Uh, but I'm just looking for guidance, and I totally recognize you may not have that. And with that, I'm just going to shut up for the rest of the night. Maybe not for the rest of the night, but thank you, Chris. Um, I think I'm going to try to throw it over to Donna to try to answer that. Um, what I can say is that um, I know that our, our superintendent and our administrators are trying to do their best to forecast. And like you said, it's really hard. And, and the one word I want to change in, there's just one word that I want to change in something you said, which is not if the students need these interventions, it's they do. We just don't know to what degree um, and how many, because we have no idea. But I'm going to uh, throw it over to Don. Okay, so um, a couple of the things that we have been doing already. Um, we realize that, as Elizabeth said, it's not if it, it, it is, it is a reality that we're going to have many students who are behind, um, who ha aren't meeting what we, uh, what our bench, say grade level or, or course benchmarks are. Uh, we, we know this is a reality. One of the things that we're talking about, and we've been meeting twice a week um, for about two hours a session um, as an administrative team, and we're meeting tomorrow morning, and one of the big topics of conversation is end of the year, and is there, um, is there a way to uh, look at our end of the year and provide some remediation to our students um, who we can identify right now that, reme that need remediation. Um, we will be um, changing, um, looking at changing, um, modifying some of our end of the year benchmarks, re realizing that kids are not going to be where they normally would be at the end of the year um, in many of our classes, most of our classes. So the teachers of the next year, say we're talking about fourth, uh, fourth grade students, those, those students probably uh, won't be where a normal fourth grade student would be at the end of the year. So our fifth grade teachers are going to have to, um, to realize that and then deal with that as the, the students that they're passing on to the next grade level. So we're really going to have to modify um, where we think most students are realizing that some students will be there. And so, and we will be addressing the needs of those students as well. So we're going, we know that we're going to have students all over the place. Um, the first, um, as I was saying, the first thing that we're really going to need to do is do is just some assessment. So we actually know where our students are, know what we're, we're dealing with. And we really won't know that until September when the students come back. Um, the answer about um, changing funding around within our budget, uh, we do have that, um, the ultimate number that we can't go beyond, but there, there are some provisions um, in school budgets for moving funds around. Um, it requires at times the uh, approval of the school board and may even require the, the approval of the community, but we do, have, we do have that option. And we really don't know what we're facing with these students. We know we're going to have many students who come back with social emotional issues, um, just the whole trauma of living through this, being away from their friends and teachers, um, as, as well as the academic piece. So, and, and Chris, you're right. Students all over the country, all over the world are, are going to be dealing with this. It's um, my friends who are retiring this year <laughs> are feeling very sorry for those of us that are working next year. <laughs> I 
Thank Elizabeth, you, do you want to continue? Yeah, we're, we're almost done. We're ready. We're yep. getting nope, so close. <laughs> um, so I would like, so I'm sorry, Chris, that I don't think that, that any of our administrators and certainly not Donna are in a position to, to give you a number. I think that it's a moving target and something that I think people are working very hard to try to figure out. And we, we need to keep working on the plan, but the plan is in progress. So um, we're gonna finish up with uh, goals. So at the end of the budget process, we held our budget up to our goals that we established at the beginning of um, the budget process. So goal number one was high quality education maintained and improved. This budget continues successful proven programs and services. It shows a commitment to mental and physical health and wellness for all students. It meets the enrollment demands and programmatic needs of all students. It addresses the long standing and long documented need for increased custodial support in both town and school buildings. And administrators and department heads worked as a true team to meet the needs of the system as a whole. And that greatly benefits all teachers, all students and the community. Goal two was careful examination of the line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. We felt that the, this budget met that goal. Some examples are a uh, careful study of enrollment demanded that we absorb a retirement at the middle school. And then many projects and positions in the original request budget were modified or cut. We added an extra budget meeting after adoption to re-examine and reconsider all lines. And here's where I would like people to really pay attention. The expenditure increase is 5.95%. That equates to a tax increase of 4.13%. The average tax increase of the three prior years is 5.5%. So our current tax increase is well below the average of the prior three years. And the combined town and school tax increase is estimated to be roughly 2.27%. And that information was provided by the pro forma from the town manager. And I think that's the number we all really need to pay close attention to. That is the 2.27%, which is town and school combined tax impact. So we're continuing with our goals. So we needed to do our best to support our 2020-2025 strategic plan goals with this budget. We felt that this budget supports the health and well-being of all students. We felt that this budget supports global competency. We felt that this budget supports multiple pathways and definitions of success. We felt that this budget supports safe, sustainable, and effective facilities as much as it can. This is, this is a lacking area. We also felt this budget supports environmental responsibility. Um, the needs assessment report identified many red issues. Uh, those are of dire urgency, the kind of issues that probably should have been addressed yesterday and the yellow ones are address, uh, considered important and they probably should be addressed today or tomorrow. Um, so several of those red issues are in our SRRF projects, which are going forward because those funds have been secured from the state. Building committee work is temporarily on hold and seriously degrading buildings are still a major issue. And finally, goal four, clear and continual communication. Uh, we solicited and welcomed citizen questions and comments at every meeting. We opened and closed every meeting with citizen comment. We posted all meetings and agendas and materials on the website and on Facebook. We had live broadcast and then a post online or videotape and post online of all budget meetings. Uh, Zoom meetings replaced in-person meetings by late March. And I will admit that our very first budget meeting, it may have been March 24th, uh, we were the first governmental uh, group in town uh, going ahead with this meeting, and we had uh, a, little, a little trouble um, recording, so it's a partial recording from that uh, meeting, but otherwise I feel like everything else has gone quite smoothly, and um, we have been able to have public participation in all our Zoom meetings. 
There have been thorough and timely recaps of every single budget meeting sent via email, posted on the website and Facebook. Regular budget updates have been submitted to the Cape Courier. And um, this has been especially important. There's been regular communication and collaboration among the school department, school board, and with the town manager and town council. So with that, I am finally <laughs> done with my presentation. I'd like to thank everybody for hanging in there with me. And um, if the town council would like to ask any questions, I will probably defer most of them to someone much more knowledgeable than myself. Um, so first, Elizabeth, um, I really want to thank you for the thoroughness and detail in your presentation and uh, thank all the other board members and superintendent and the building administrators and other staff uh, for their contributions um, uh, and work on the budget thus far. Um, I also want to say, at least speaking for myself, that um, I, I hope that the conversation that follows and the questions that follow um, are, are not interpreted um, in any way as, as a reflection of uh, uh, not appreciating all of that work. So um, as has as been referenced multiple times, um, you know, we're in, we're living in times that very few of us, you know, if any of us have ever experienced anything even remotely like this. Um, so I, I suspect that the questions that you'll get and the conversation that will follow is much more a reflection of those times and not specifically a reflection of the work uh, that you all have done to date. So um, I, I, I hope you'll take it, um, you know, in that context. Um, I'm going to open it up to the council for questions for Elizabeth and the board and uh, the administrators if they're able to answer. I suspect that based on what we've heard tonight that many of us um, you know, need some time to process a little bit, um, formulate some other questions if you don't have them already, which is why I, I, I figured that we will need um, the time uh, that was already uh, earmarked for tomorrow's workshop. Um, also, I'm cognizant of the fact that we, we've been at this for two hours already. Um, and so I wanna be respectful of people's time and energy. Um, you know, this is incredibly important work that we're doing. I don't want to shortchange it in any way or rush through a conversation tonight um, that uh, deserves, uh, you know, uh, full and thorough discussion and attention. So, um, so if folks have either initial comments or some pertinent questions that they want to put on the table for right now, uh, I'll entertain those, but also, um, you know, it's fully my intention that we, that we hold our meeting tomorrow night. Um, with my expectation that folks will have a lot more questions uh, that follow then. So uh, with that being said, uh, let me pull back up my participant list. I'm gonna go to Chairman Adams and then uh, Councillor Penny Jordan. So Valerie Adams, go ahead. I think Penny had her hand up first, but- Oh, okay. I don't know if you wanna call on her first. Sure, if you're yielding, I'll, I, I, didn't see which order they went up. So Penny, you go ahead first then. Okay, Doug. Um, Jamie, I'm glad you said, uh, suggested we take time to kind of digest everything that we've heard because I think uh, the presentation that um, Elizabeth did was fantastic. Um, and uh, I appreciated all the work that went into that. I want to say right up front that I really do not question uh, the work and uh, due diligence that went into creating um, this budget. And, uh, but my, my position, and I, I really appreciate what Chris Straw uh, brought forward, is that um, I truly would like to, number one, see a budget that, that's representative of what, what we are going to be uh, dealing with and how the uh, how we as a town um, and this schools being a significant part of where our revenues go um, how we address the challenges that we're going to have with students at the same time we're addressing challenges where our revenues could be decreasing and um, and we could face having um, 
having jobs within um, our town, whether it be the school or municipal, that we have to address the amount of staffing and whether it aligns with our revenues. I think there's a lot of unknowns, but I think we do know that there are some um, challenging uh, times ahead of us. So I'd really like to see what that were, what that needs to look like um, and how we're going to address the needs of the students as they're coming back into, um, and I'll make the assumption they're coming back to the campus um, uh, because I hope that it isn't the other alternative because I think that's going to even be more detrimental to all of the students, no matter what age. Uh, before going to Council Adams, is there anybody from the school board or, or um, uh, staff that would like to speak to that or? I don't know that we can answer Councillor Jordan's question. I think um, I, I could try to bring it over to Donna again, but I think that you and um, Councillor Strav hit on like the big question with the capital Q. What are we really going to need? What will it really look like? I, it, it's, it's, it's an unknown it's, and it's tricky. Um, so I guess for a follow up to try to, try to get some clarification from um, Penny, um, are you asking to, would you wish to see uh, like a mock-up or a projection of what the, the would superintendent I, and administrators would actually, you know, consider they actually might need in the fall to address those needs? What I see that the, uh, the current budget does is that it really um, uh, ad addresses the status quo. You know, here, here we are, we're continuing to build off our goals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I think that that's, that's not where we necessarily are going to land. Um, and that you, you can't do, I shouldn't say you can't, it would be the ultimate challenge to do both, to, to do, um, um, to achieve what's been laid out in the existing budget and to also address the needs of the students coming back to campus. I think that um, what I am suggesting is that we know that students coming back to campus are going to have challenges. We know that we're going to have to baseline them. We know that we're going to have to probably make shifts. We know all of these things. I, I hate to sound callous or whatever, but I think you're going to have to reground and, um, and almost feel like a pause in order to move ahead again. Uh, because I think that's what this situation has caused is almost a pause button. So now how do we start it and keep and start it moving forward? And when Chris suggested, do we look at, do we have to shift dollars from extracurriculars, um, curricular activities? Uh, that can impact some students who need that in order to stay in school. But do we need to cut them back? Those are, those are the things, that's where I think we are at, is we hit the pause button, we now need to restart it. And you're not gonna, the, the budget to me that's put forward is a absence of a pause button. Um, I, I, I wouldn't wanna be sitting in your chair right now. I really wouldn't uh, because you're having to hype come up with scenarios that say, here, here are the things that we know could be entering, coming onto campus, and we need to rally all of the experience and um, compassion and uh, thoughtfulness of all of the teachers on campus to, to some extent, do what they don't normally do on a daily basis. 
So they're being asked to do a job to bring kids off the pause button back into a world where they can feel uh, competent, uh, successful, emotionally supported, and all of those things. And to me, the budget that we have in front of us is absent of that. I really appreciate your clarification and I can see where you're coming from now and I've written that down. Um, what I will say is that, so if you go back to that list that I showed, the list that showed what was cut out and what is in the budget. Yep, I saw that. Okay, so what um, council, community members and even school board needs to understand is that uh, we approve a number and not we don't approve the positions. If we show up in the fall and it could look completely different. And so it's not necessarily that um, we're approving positions. Those are what right now, what is driving the budget. Honestly, it's probably not enough money, but that's, we've heard from quite a few people that, that they don't believe we are going to be able to, or should have more money. So we've been able to uh, justify and and um, strongly advocate for that amount of money because in the end it's really up to the superintendent um, it, it could be that we you know we approve this number and we think we're going to have these positions and these certain projects and in the fall she and her team have ha completely you know over the summer had to completely change as you said what that number now supports because in the end, uh, on the school board level, we don't micromanage, you know, what the, the principals and the, the superintendent choose to do. Our, our job is really the number. So I share that with you because I agree with you and that this, so this budget is really, you know, we've got the number and the positions that are in there to support it. But in the end, those, those positions could change and they might have to. Donna, do you have any more that you want to add in, in reference? Well, I think one of the positions that's going, going to be really important to keep is that guidance counselor position at Pond Cove, because I think we're going to have a lot of little ones that come in that, that have issues. So I think that that position is extremely important to keep. We also know that with students, um, building relationships is so important. And if you um, if you, the fewer teachers you have, the less chance you have of building deep relationships with our students. It's, it's going to be a lot on the classroom teachers to, um, to support their students and to, um, to make, uh, to fill in the gaps. And we need, we need teachers to be able to do that. And if teachers are piled on with very large classes, um, as they would be if we um, eliminated the positions at the high school, um, that just wouldn't be able to happen. So I think, um, you know, our teachers, um, we have great teachers. They know their students. Um, they're willing to support their students. Um, but we have to be careful about the numbers of students that we give them because if we if we overwhelm them with large numbers of students, which some of those high school teachers have very large classes, um, they they won't be able to um, to break them into groups to to address their needs where they are. So I think we have to be really careful about that. And um, I know we're very cognizant of um, the economic times. Um, but I don't think that uh, eliminating positions at this point is going to do our students. I don't think I'm suggesting eliminating positions right. are, are with students. What I suggest is that the uh, positions that are not student centric um, maybe need to be um, vetted a, a, a little more. It, this might not be the time to have um, uh, the additional janitorial positions, um, that there could be positions that are um, um, also support roles that um, maybe need to be um, looked at. I think if uh, I look at the budget, it's um, the money should be spent on stabilizing children. Um, Thank you. And, 
if you need to ask volunteers from the community to come in and do other things on that school campus, I think that if we're trying to balance dollars expended, where those dollars go, and we have a com community that is very engaged in um, ensuring that we take care of people in our town, that I bet there could be a whole different type of volunteer service that people uh, ad adopt three classrooms and they become the cleaners for them, uh, something. But there are ways to focus energy and dollars on students and identify ways to engage the community in addressing the problem together versus just saying, uh, give me more dollars, it's give me some time. And that's what, that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Penny, that's great. Councilor Adams. Um, I, had, I have more comment than question at this point. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you on the school board for the work that you did. Um, and thank you for that presentation tonight. Um, it's definitely, a tough year for all of this. And um, Jamie, I appreciate you leaving tomorrow open for questions because I have a lot of thinking to do and likely will have some tough questions tomorrow, but I don't want those tough questions to be perceived. I mean, that I don't appreciate the work that all of you did because you clearly went through this budget very carefully and thought through things. And I appreciate the process and the time that you took. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Gableson. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth and Donna, for the presentation. Again, um, I think I, I'm very grateful for all the work that you guys have put into this. Um, I think maybe to build a little bit on what Penny is asking, um, one of the things that I think would be really helpful for me in thinking about this, this budget and this decision would be um, having some, some thought into some additional scenarios and how they might play out. The budget is kind of presented as, as, a, as a particular scenario that envisions how those resources will be deployed. And I, one of the challenges we're facing right now is there's uncertainty both on the revenue side and on the expenditure side. And there's also uncertainty on what we're gonna be able to do or not do. So I think the likelihood that we are going to be living in a world where the scenario that is presented in this budget plays out um, seems slim. <laughs> um, and so what, and I, I realize this is more than is possible to do before tomorrow night. <laughs> um, but you know, what, what, what I, what I'd like to see is, you know, so one scenario is we, go back to school and we have to have 10 kids in a classroom max. You know, what is, what are the resources? What does that look like from a resource perspective? Do we have what, you know, are there, are there options that we have that would let us meet that with the resources that are in this budget or not? What if we go back for remote learning for part of the year, you know, th those kinds of things. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not expecting these to be highly refined calculations, but those, you know, a little some additional thought on what, what those scenarios look like I think would be really helpful for me to Chris's point just to make sure that you guys have the resources that you're going to need to meet the needs of the students um, and that you know that's that's a, a priority for me in this in this combined budget um, and and then the other thing that I'm just thinking about as I go back looking through the municipal side of the budget, um, which I realize we're not talking about tonight, but as I look through all the expenditures in there, I think, you know, there, there's, there's less uncertainty in much of the municipal budget, um, just because of the nature of, of how those expenditures are made. But the questions that I'm asking myself with all of the expenditures that we have in the municipal budget going back through it is, are these resources that we need to support the ongoing emergency response? 
If the answer is yes, it's a no brainer. Are these resources that we need to make sure that our community is going to continue to thrive as we recover from this? That seems like a good expenditure of resources. And if the answer to both of those is no, some capital expenditures are gonna fall in this third category. Is this something that if we put it off a year or two years, it's gonna cost us more? And then it gets into some gray area because if it costs a little bit more, you know, I don't know. But, um, but those, are, those are kind of the questions I'm asking myself as I look through the municipal budget and recognizing that there's a lot more uncertainty on, on the revenue side as well as the expense side in the school budget. I don't know how useful those are to you in thinking through what the scenarios might look like, but that's kind of, that's the way I'm trying to start thinking through this so that we can come to something, a budget where we're going to meet the needs of, of taxpayers who are, are hurting, but also have the resources we need to support the appropriate response. Thank you. I don't, obviously we can't answer that right now. Um, I, I would jump in with kind of a follow up to that. Um, I think that, um, and, and hopefully, you know, the benefit of uh, some of the time that I talked about at the outset of the meeting, um, that we, we have the opportunity to buy ourselves here by, um, by pushing out the referendum vote uh, in uh, council vote on this by just a little bit is that there are certain things in both, and I agree, it's not just um, contained to the school budget, th certain things that both the school budget and the municipal budget that make assumptions that are, look like they're becoming increasingly likely that they won't be accurate, right? So if you think about, um, uh, and it's been talked about here a little bit, you know, there may be curtailment that would have to be dealt with. Um, it, 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 you know, there was a lot of, discussion out of Augusta today uh, with the governor um, convening a couple of her economic councils and looking at impact to revenues and, and forecasts for the fiscal year and all that kind of stuff. I think it's increasingly likely that we're going to see um, some sort of reduction on the municipal side in revenue sharing. Um, that was something that Councillor Adams and I heard last week at a, at a forum that we participated in. Um, the point of all this is to say that I think um, with both the school and the municipal budget, um, we need to start drawing up, um, you know, some contingency versions that look at, well, if this increasingly likely reality actually becomes the reality, what does that impact? What does that look like? As opposed to going forward um, with fingers crossed and hoping that the things that we've already got built into the budget, as far as a revenue perspective go, continue to stay there. So I would turn to Matt you and to Donna to say, you know, again, not that we need anything reworked necessarily for tomorrow's meeting, um, but, f you know, from my view, um, I think we need to go back and, and look at some of those assumptions that we've made and really challenge ourselves to, to see how realistic we think those assumptions remain today. Um, that's one thing. Um, another thing that perhaps Matt you, you, you could address even now or certainly um, just sort of narratively by, by tomorrow's meeting is um, I, I appreciated the point that was made at the conclusion of your presentation, Elizabeth, about, um, you know, the, the, the difference between, um, uh, you know, increase or, or delta on the expense line versus what that means to the, the bottom line net impact to taxes. Um, it's interesting. I actually had, you know, there was a constituent who reached out to me quite concerned, um, though maybe not as many folks are paying attention to it, that if you look at the actual uh, increase on the expense side on the municipal side this year, it looks exorbitant. Um, uh, I'm not going to say it out loud because I certainly, <laughs> but yeah. And so, um, you know, there, there's some work that, that um, John Cordero Cotoraro and Matt have been doing to reclass some expenses that for a long time um, have, you know, fallen in, in, into one form of accounting um, and are being rejiggered, um, you know, for a more accurate picture of how we're actually funding those activities. So um, a number that looks really big on the town side for an increase in expenses is actually in reality not um, nearly as exorbitant um, from an impact to taxes standpoint. So my question for you, Matt, though, is um, 
when we hear people, you know, make requests for flat budgets and things like that, my, my view is, is what is the net impact of taxes and, and, and whether or not their actual taxes are going up and, and less about the mechanics of how we get to that number. And so I'm curious if you could either tonight or for tomorrow's meeting, um, just have a little bit of a, a, a primer, if you will, on, you know, for every, uh, you know, X amount that something gets reduced on the expense side, this is the corresponding change that we see on that net to taxes. I don't know if there's a way to simplify that um, in an explanation, you know, for both the council, the school board and the public that, that is dialed in. Um, I, I think we can assume that nothing's gonna change on the revenue side in a positive way. Um, so obviously there's two ways that that number moves, either uh, the net to taxes is, is, is as a result of a decrease in expenses or it's a result of an increase in revenues. I, I think we're all pretty much in agreement that we're not likely to see an increase in revenues. Um, so just a, an understanding of a, 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 on sort of a step basis. So, you know, if you reduce expenses by this much, this is what the net impact to taxes winds up being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So is that something that we could possibly at least have some discussion around tomorrow night. I don't want to put you on the spot to do that right now necessarily, but uh, no, uh, no spot, uh, no spot where you required, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, the uh, that's one of those things that you look at consistently throughout the whole budget process is what the net impact is going to be to the taxpayers. And uh, you know, when it's all said and done, it comes down to being a big fraction. So if uh, you know, it sounds like what what you're asking is really trying to to give people a, a nuts and bolts understanding as to what the bottom line impact is going to be on their tax dollar uh, when we do go to commitment of taxes later in the summer. And you know, at the start of the budget process, the in anticipated growth in value, uh, if you think about the big fraction is on the top of the fraction is the amount of money that needs to be raised for the town and the school to pay all of their bills. And on the bottom of that fraction is the, is the overall municipal value. So looking at that pro forma, uh, at the bottom line that shows what the anticipated uh, town's taxable value is. Uh, at the start of the process, we were looking at an estimate of increase in value of $10 million. And uh, looking at where we're at, at this point in time right now, our, I know we'll be booking at least 15 million. So that is an increase in, uh, you know, in capacity that will be there. So that helps offset any increase in expenditures that both the town and the school may may feel. So uh, I'll have a better better reflection of that for tomorrow night that I can that I'd be happy to share with council as well as uh, um, uh, school board and and other members of the public who who, uh, who tune in. But uh, I'll be able to give you a pretty good impact as to where we're looking at as well as some of the changes that. Uh, you know, I may want to bring forward related to the uh, to the school, but sorry, to the town budget as well at this point in time, because uh, you know there are in, there are anticipated efficiencies we are going to find uh, due to the reductions that we've had this this past uh, six to seven weeks uh, due to operating expenses that we were looking to try to to book to try to save some uh, impact on next year's taxes as well. Uh, so, uh, but no, that is something that I'll be fully anticipating and able to give uh, a full nuts and bolts uh, number. Uh, so you can say, okay, if if, we, if if the town takes off X amount of dollars and the school takes off X amount of dollars, you could be looking at a 1% or a 2% overall tax increase, or if, you're, if your anticipated goal is zero, I can give you kind of an idea as to how you can get to that point, at least from a leverage standpoint. Well, I think what it would help us all to really have a better understanding, and I appreciate that, Matt, and I look forward to seeing that. I think what it really will help us all to understand is when we hear from citizens that say, you know, in these times, and we've heard comments tonight and in our emails and things like that, that we, it, 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 we just can't be thinking about um, you know, increasing the amount that we're, we're asking citizens to, to reach into their pockets and dig deeper and everything. And I totally understand that. I think, I think what we need to have a better understanding of is roughly – you know, and, and, and not getting into the details of, well, are we cutting this program or are we cutting this or et cetera? I'm talking in, in more macro terms of, you know, what actually needs to reduce to get to that point. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we that we have, that. we have something to discuss and, and at least yeah. be comparative around um, versus just, you know, throwing out a statement that says we just shouldn't increase anything. Because, I mean, one, one of the things um, is, is obviously – uh, it, it, we're, we're not in a position where even if you just roll over 
on both the municipal and school side last year's plan and and say we're, we're not we're not going to add any new you know any of these things that are accounted for in the in the chart that elizabeth showed that show you know the seven hundred and twenty eight thousand nine hundred fifty one dollars of of new ask even if you didn't have any of that stuff on the school side or any of the things that you've asked for on the town side you and your staff have asked for it still doesn't cost the same this year or in next fiscal year as it did this year um, to, to fund programs so um, I think we just have to have a little bit better understanding of um, what amount we'd actually be talking about reducing to um, in order to have that zero increase or as close to it as, as we think we might be able to get to. So, sure. Amy, um, may I just quickly yep, piggyback and thank you for asking that question. Um, and I like, I appreciate that you're asking Matt to do this because I think on the school board side, um, we have a pretty good understanding of, of what you know, each percentage point in expenditure, you know, what, what does that um, corresponding actual dollar value do? And then that happens to go down to uh, the school side tax impact. But, you know, the combined tax impact, I mean, it's a completely different number. It's a, the fraction that Matt talks about is something that the school board never deals with. And so um, having an understanding of, you know, the, the sort of combined amount and how, you know, if, if we wanted to, you know, reduce that, that combined tax to the, you know, that's the municipal and school that goes to the taxpayer. Um, I, I would love to hear about that from uh, the town manager. So thank you, Jamie. No problem, uh, Council Devereaux. Um, I, I agree, thank you, Matt. I think that's really important for, for us to have those numbers. And I, um, I'd really like to thank the school board and the department heads for all the work they've done on this. And everyone who sent us texts, uh, texts, who sent us emails, called, reached out. I think it's been really important for us to have your input and feedback in this process. One of the things I'm curious about, which I'd like to know um, if you can talk about it tomorrow, uh, Donna, is um, what is the school doing or thinking about doing to reduce operational expenses for this year? Are you furloughing people now? What does that look like and what are your plans now? Um, and as Penny said, do you have a, a contingency plan? Are there other plans? Have you thought about if students are behind, they can uh, repeat school the school year next year? Have you thought about creative ways um, to work with that. And um, the idea about volunteers, I think um, volunteers are super important. We have so many people in this community that have so much to offer, um, whether it's tutoring or working in the classroom. I think it's a really great way to balance the dollars. And I don't feel like we're here to micromanage your, your budget, but I think that maybe we can all have a conversation and um, help work through it a little bit. But in the, um, but I'd really like to, to know what you're thinking of about um, those operational expenses now, what you can reduce and what that may look like um, in September, if the kids don't come back to school in September, what, um, how would that help next year's budget? So I'd like to understand a little bit of that too. Thank you. Jamie, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Apologies for that. I, I was trying to say, is there any other questions or comments from counselors at this point? And I'm not seeing any. Um, Elizabeth or Donna, is there any, uh, or anybody else from the school board for that matter, uh, any other uh, remarks that you wanted to offer at this time? I'd just like to thank the town council again for um, 
hanging in there and for your uh, thoughtful questions. And, and I think that Donna and the administrators and all of us appreciate that this was um, a really unusual um, year with an unusual presentation and um, your you know need to come back tomorrow night. And, and I think there's gonna be a need to come back again later. So we appreciate the time given to do some research and there you know, probably won't be uh, very specific and wonderful plans drawn up between tonight and tomorrow night, but um, I appreciate the opportunity for conversation. And um, this has been, and I hope will continue to be a, a really positive collaborative process. So thank you to um, town council. You're welcome. Um, so with that, um, We'll segue uh, Heather has into. Oh, I'm sorry. I I have it. I am the gallery view, and so I can't see. Well, oh, okay. Uh, go. And I see Jeremy, your hand too. But Heather, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Yes. Um, I sort of would like to reiterate that as well. I have felt very supported this evening by the town council. The appreciation that was mentioned by everyone was definitely heard. Um, and I think this whole process has been wonderful. I want to say thank you to Jamie uh, earlier for making the comment of the questions that you have for us not to take them personally, that they're not about the process, they're not about what we're doing. Um, and I can just speak for myself. I hear that very loudly and clearly. And, um, you know, the questions are, I, I think we're all trying to do the best we can for the students who, as Chris started the big conversation mentioning, like are in a disastrous quote unquote position right now. Um, and, you know, also talking about their, their future lives are at stake. And also the conversation that we're having about how to, how to balance that with responsibility to the taxpayers. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for this conversation, um, for the mutual respect that feels like it is very palpable and present right now. Um, and I just wanted to offer my gratitude. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Jeremy, you had a comment? Um, actually, I just wanted to ask a process question about tomorrow night. Um, Go ahead. So we have, uh, my understanding is we have both a special meeting at six followed by a workshop at seven. Correct. Uh, and I just wanted, was curious, um, you know, how that works timing wise, if, if the uh, special meeting winds up taking I guess if it winds up taking longer, we start the, the workshop when the special meeting ends. But I, I just wanted to, in case people were interested in tuning in for one and not, not the other, um, make sure we kind of address that before we adjourn. No, I, yep, sure, thank you, um, appreciate that. Um, so there are in fact two separate Zoom links for the individual meetings, two separate agendas. It's not all one big meeting. So thank you for pointing that out. So um, just for clarity's purpose, uh, the council will be meeting at six, six o'clock tomorrow night, the 28th, um, to convene in special session, um, specifically regarding um, you know, discussion and updates to some of the emergency measures, um, emergency actions and emergency orders that we had put in place previously, um, uh, specifically in response to the um, uh, emergency. Um, then we are scheduled to meet uh, at approximately seven o'clock. Um, uh, you know, Chairman Adams will be running the special meeting. Um, I know that um, we'll obviously try to st stay as close to that schedule as possible, but um, hope that folks that are specifically looking to tune in um, for the continuation of this budget discussion um, will, uh, you know, grant us some forbearance and indulgence um, if some of the important discussion going on in the six o'clock meeting carries over. So um, uh, that's, I think, the best we can do with that. We'll try and stick as close to schedule as possible, but, um, but also we'll, we'll have to end that meeting and, and start up the Zoom. And I know that Matt's got all the details, um, you know, so to make sure we're on track with that. So um, go ahead, Matt. Uh, th thank you, sir. Uh, yes, actually, there's only one, uh, one Zoom identifier for the meeting tomorrow night. So it's interesting. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll roll right through just uh, trying to make it more efficient for the public to be able to just have a con continuity. So if someone wants to join in. Sorry for, the, in sorry for that. No, that's okay. I, we, we, uh, last week we did do the separate, uh, two separate meetings because the executive session. That's what I thought I had seen first of all. So, yeah, okay. No, okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So ignore that. But. <laughs>
um, makes it a little easier for folks. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, e either way, we'll try and stick to as close to the schedule I know as, as, we, as we can. Um, any other counselors or anybody else um, on the panel with any questions or comments? Nasser? Yeah, uh, good evening. Um, Jim, thank you very much for the uh, great conversation we've had so far. And I know a lot of people have put questions towards um, what's the future. None of us have the crystal ball for the future. Um, but at some point, we have to make decisions. Uh, we are trying to budget for, uh, again, something that's a, a moving target. So we do not know if the pandemic is going to continue uh, consistently for three months or it's going to be periodically. Um, so, for example, we started this a week or two, schools are closed, and then it continue for months. And so at some point, we need to make a decision uh, if, if scenarios, so for example, if you want to uh, close the schools from the fall for six months, then yes, maybe we can take a decision uh, and request teachers of other stuff, or ask Donna of other stuff as well, tell the teachers to stay home longer and so forth. For the fact that it's a roller coaster is unknown, it's, uh, uh, it's go ups and down, it's, it's very tough for any of us to make a, a decision base and put a money uh, onto that as well. So my point is that uh, if it was known that if we can, if we can make a decision uh, now and saying that, okay, we're gonna close school for the whole year then we'll, and we're gonna do everything from uh, home school, then we will know what, what, how to work our budget. And we can say, okay, certain teachers are required, certain teachers are not required, can, people can collaborate. Now, if you, if you say, okay, the school's gonna be closed from fall for six months, then people can make a decision that way. But right now, we are, we are all anticipating hardship, uh, but none of us are able to make uh, a decision unless we make a decision without, without the money, without money being involved uh, in taking the option of scenarios. So we have to identify some scenarios, some options, what if option one, option two, option three. I don't know if you understand my point, but if not, I think Elizabeth is my good translator. She can translate for me. I think you did pretty well, Nasser. I think you're, you're echoing the chorus that it's hard, it's hard to, uh, it is a, I think your word is right. It's a roller coaster. We don't know. I think everybody would love um, to, for the superintendent and the administrators to continue to work on different scenarios. And I, I appreciate that we're going to be back and answer some questions tonight, but I don't know that we will have answers to all the questions. And to Jamie's point, we actually have a little um, release pressure valve by the fact that we don't have the validation until July, we do hope, we can hope that we do have some more answers and we do have some time to work on those scenarios. Yes? Okay, so decisions are being made tomorrow, basically we have till July then for more uh, workshop, more discussion. I just, I, I mean, I, I don't really believe and I've, I don't think that the town council will, I, and I'm, I'm somehow, somehow I'm the finance chair speaking for the town council, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> that I don't believe the town council is going to be prepared to give guidance tomorrow night is my understanding. I think that we're going to have questions. Well, and we're going yeah, to have I, I, so I think this serves as a good segue um, and I'll speak for myself, not necessarily on behalf of the whole council, but what I expect tomorrow is that people will have had a chance to, to really think about what was presented tonight in, in a lot more, um, you know, thoughtful way. Um, and, and go back and review some of the other materials that were all provided and formulate some questions. And, and um, I think Matt and uh, as, as, as I had asked for, you know, we'll be able to at least paint some scenarios for us. The, you know, if we do X, this is what that means. This is what impact would be achieved from that. Um, and then, I mean, I would expect that coming out of tomorrow, there'll be some direction, um, maybe not a, a, a you know, consensus decision, but some direction on, on which way we think we need to head with this. Um, and I think like, like has been said, it stated, and just to reiterate that the, the fact that, um, you know, we'll, we'll likely be in a position of, of pushing out the, the schedule by about 30 to 40 days or so, 
um, you know, gives us a little bit of breathing room to run some more scenarios if we need be, have some further discussion to weigh impact, to weigh, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, uh, additional information that may or may not come in. You know, we may know in, in two or three weeks time what that state revenue picture is going to look like, what that impact is going to be, and be able to not guess at, at, at that scenario, but, but have a much more concrete answer as to what that reality will be, for example. Um, so, um, in fact, I, I mean, Matt, one, one of the things that came up last Thursday in the GP COG call that I referenced earlier was that the April revenue share hadn't come in yet and was three days late. I don't know if, I don't know if you, either you or John can, has that, has that come in yet? Are we still waiting on that from the state? Because <laughs> one thing that was alluded to was the fact that, you know, if you see your April number come in a lot lower than you would forecast, you have a good idea of which way the wind is blowing, so. Yes, the April uh, numbers did come in last week. And? and it, yes, it was lower than we expected. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of additional incremental data that we'll be able to add to our scenarios to have, again, uh, what, what I've said to a few people that, you know, is, is obviously the most difficult and certainly the most frustrating aspect of the position we find ourselves in, aside from obviously the public health crisis, uh, you know, f first and foremost, is that we as leaders uh, of, the, of the two bodies here are in a position of having to, to you know, make concrete decisions with, um, you know, very um, incomplete at best information about what the future picture will look like. Um, so, you know, the, the, the more we can remove uh, the variables, uh, you know, and, and again, maybe 30 to 40 days time, um, you know, will give us, uh, at least in some areas, a slightly clearer picture of that. I think the better off we'll be for some of the decisions we have to make. Um, but, you know, to go back to the point I was making a little bit, I think, I think tomorrow, coming out of tomorrow's meeting, I would expect that there'll at the very least be some, some degree of direction from which, you know, we, we go down a path to further work together. Um, so that's number one. Um, so, um, Seeing no other hands raised um, from members of the council or school board, um, is there anybody that's still with us from the public that um, wants to uh, add any uh, questions or uh, public comment at this time? Um, again, we will be meeting tomorrow. Uh, there'll be opportunity both prior to the meeting as well as the conclusion of the meeting for public comment tomorrow. Um, but if you, um, if you have any comment now, uh, uh, more than willing to take that again if you could just give us your name your uh, address and try and keep your comments uh, to three minutes that'd be great so um, Rosemary Townsend your hand is raised again so um, once Matt gets you queued up uh, we'll hear from you in just a second you now can you hear me got it go ahead yep yeah well thank you very much um, especially Elizabeth and uh, um, uh, Jamie, uh, for information you have shared. I want to just kind of jump on Penny Jordan's uh, comment a little bit um, with one uh, idea is that um, I'm not sure what classes are offered in the high school anymore other than, you know, if we look at our schools as the gold standard, you know, if we look at the basics of, re you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic to be simplistic, um, maybe we can go back to the core classes that we absolutely have to have and then look at some of the others that might be, you know, like last year, I think there was a photography class. Maybe that's something that we don't offer this year, if we do even, uh, those types of things. Um, so that those teacher resources that are used, used there can maybe be attributed someplace else. Um, and then the other thing I was going to comment on is there are a lot of comparisons of our school district versus other uh, gold standard school districts. Um, have we uh, checked in with them since the uh, COVID episodes uh, to see how they may be dealing with it with their schools and um, what might uh, they be thinking of next year? Uh, so that we stay in line with that type of a, a school thinking. And I also agree with Penny in terms of uh, volunteers. I mean, I think there are probably a lot of things in the school that could be done by volunteers and also probably by some of the many unemployed people next year. Thank you. That's all. 
I, and I, I appreciate all the work you guys have done a masterful job. There's no doubt about it. Um, but again, I mean, this is like a tsunami has come and it's going to hit the state. It's going to hit uh, everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see Ruth Ann Haley's uh, hand raised. So Matt, once you cue her up, go Thanks ahead, go, Ruth. Sir. Hi, go ahead, good Ruth evening. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your service. Um, I greatly appreciate and I understand the commitment that you have had to this community. Um, and Elizabeth, you did a great job justifying the work that you have done. And I understand that you want the best for the students in Cape Elizabeth. Having said that, here's my big but. What I would like you to do is think about what we do in our house. What do you absolutely need versus what's on your want list? And so as you're thinking about sort of the variables that are before us with the labor market and the economy and the stability of our community, which may not be so stable if people are losing their jobs and can't pay for their mortgages and things might change. You know, the sands are moving and we really can't make decisions. But what we can do is make a list of what we absolutely have to have and then make a list of what we would like to have and then prioritize those things. So I hope you think about that as you move forward. I know there's a lot of variables that we don't know, but if we make a list of what we absolutely need in every classroom with every teacher, like Penny said, you know, the teachers that are with the students are the most valuable. And the one thing I do know about teachers, they are very creative. So if you go back and talk to your departments and say, if you really had to make changes just for a short time, what can you think of that we can do differently and still provide a wonderful experience socially and academically? Thank you very much. Uh, hi, this is Rob Hubs. It's not Susanna. Um, oh, Rob, hold on just a second. I, I again was talking to mute. Um, Ruthann, if you're still there, if you don't mind um, just sharing your address with us because we didn't I'm catch here. that earlier. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. I live at 49 Brentwood Road. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Now over to Rob. Uh, um, go ahead, Rob Hubs, and your address, please. Uh, 18 Belfield Road. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I just think that uh, the, the the schools are really in a in a in a tough position in terms of being to being able to deliver excellence uh, on you know what comparatively is a very low amount of money, and uh, it's a it's a huge asset to the town. And I know that everything seems very scary night right now, but um, <clears throat> I'm very confident that the uh, that the economy will uh, improve and that, that and that Cape Elizabeth will be uh, right in the middle of that. So I think that the the ask by our school system, considering its value to the town, is is very modest, and I fully support it. It's barely above uh, the price of inflation, and. Uh, we should uh, realize its its value. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Is there anybody else that wishes to offer a public comment at this point? Okay. So seeing none, um, I again just want to thank everybody um, from the school board and the school department, uh, town uh, council as well. Uh, and for all the public participation, um, you know, I, I have to say one thing that um, has been a pleasant byproduct of um, this whole situation is I think we've had really good public engagement um, through this meeting format. 
um, and I appreciate people's patience with the technology platform um, and encourage people to keep keep coming out and participating. Um, I want to thank everybody who offered uh, emails, uh, calls uh, in advance of the meeting and uh, who I assume will continue to do so as we work our way through this pro process. Um, I know that uh, council reads all of them uh, and uh, considers them uh, very thoughtfully. Um, and we appreciate you all taking the time uh, to, to share your opinions and put forward your ideas. Um, it's very helpful for us in terms of uh, understanding sentiment and, um, and uh, we encourage you to keep doing that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is um, just a note of, uh, of empathy really uh, for everybody uh, in our community. Um, we've heard here from a few people tonight who have had very real and direct impacts um, that have come from uh, this situation. And uh, I know, I, I think I can confidently speak for not only the council, but everybody that's participating here tonight to, to say that, um, you know, the community really does feel a tremendous amount of empathy for anybody um, that has been so directly impacted. And, um, you know, I think one thing that, that I have faith in is, uh, you know, that as we go through things like this, uh, we do so with a sense of um, togetherness, and community purpose. Um, that, uh, that, you know, that I hope will continue to shine um, and, and hopefully be a light at the end of the tunnel um, that we're all sort of traversing through at the moment. So um, for anybody that, that has been, um, you know, really adversely impacted, I also just want to remind folks of, um, you know, the different services that the town is trying to provide and connect people to, whether um, it be, um, you, know, uh, you know, various uh, forms of social service relief, or other kinds of community services. Um, uh, one of the things we just did was get the hotline going this past week um, and, and appreciative of, of Matt and, and Kathy Raftis and, and the efforts that they're putting in there. Um, but the town is really looking to, to be, um, you know, a connector for folks. And, and if there's help that can be offered, um, we're trying to stand ready to do that. So I um, want to encourage people to take advantage of that if they, if they feel the need. So um, with that, uh, we'll reconvene again tomorrow. Um, again, following the, uh, the special session meeting at six o'clock. Uh, so look for you right back here um, tomorrow night. And thank you all again. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Good night. Take care, guys. Thanks, you guys. Good night.